interviewed Barbara Bidding. She's a board certified chaplain. She is over at Buffalo Mercy Hospital in the Spiritual Care Department. And uh, the mission statement for Catholic Health is we are called to reveal the healing love of Jesus to those in need. So when I first started talking with Barbara, I asked her about um, her credentials and how she got involved with being a chaplain and I lost you. Can you still see me? Oops. Melanie, sorry, I can still see you, keep going. I did that purposely. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So um, she is a board certified chaplain with the National Association of Catholic Chaplains. And she received a Master's of Arts in Pastoral Ministry from Christ the King Seminary, which is in East Aurora, as I'm sure you probably know. And Christ the King also, as well as preparing um, priests, also prepares lay ministers for human, spiritual, intellectual, and pastoral care. As part of the program, she has to do a residency, and she did do hers at Buffalo Mercy. She's been a part of the spiritual care team at Mercy for 11 years and her denomination is Roman Catholic. So just a little background. We uh, sat down, we had a general discussion for about an hour. We sat over coffee in her office and I asked, I told her that we were, I would like to talk to her about how she helps patients and families with death and dying. And she told me that there are nine chaplains on staff at the hospital, three are full-time including herself. All the chaplains, interestingly, are not Catholic. Being with the Catholic health system, they all come from different denominations, which is kind of nice because um, the hospital serves all people. So she, she did tell me that even though her peers come from different backgrounds, they accomplish many of the same goals with the patients and family, family members. And the reason that they can do this is because it's not necessarily about the person's faith or religious background, it's about the chaplains being able to listen and help people cope. When I asked her to respond to the needs, when I asked to respond to the needs of what she does when she responds to the needs of families during our rapid responses and codes and strokes, Barbara says that she has a sense of awareness with the families. Um, she uses the word awareness quite a bit in our conversation. And she says that she does this by just being present, validating their feelings, praying, she has a very gentle, quiet tone, and if the families or the patients have any special needs, she helps to facilitate those. I asked her, um, what does she do when there's not an emergency, because not everybody is always in crisis. And she said that the chaplains are assigned to different units, and they walk around, they talk to the patients and the family members, they listen, they determine if they have any, any needs, and she told me that people like to be listened to when they're in the hospital, especially when they're uncertain about their health or their own mortality. She mm -hmm. says she particularly seeks out people who seem, um, her words were disheveled or angry. And uh, she, her words were that she does try to do what she feels Jesus would do in those situations. I asked her about the different religious populations that are seen at the hospital. Not surprisingly, not surprisingly most of our patients are Catholic. Um, they're from the Buffalo area. Um, traditionally, they were mostly from South Buffalo, but now from everywhere. And she told me that Catholics, most people who are Catholic will seek out sacrament of the sick. They will ask for it. The second largest population is Muslim. And that's because in Lackawanna, that's home for many Muslim Americans. And those patients in the hospital, they're generally quiet. They like to keep to, the, to themselves and their family. And they will usually call their own imam. Thirdly, we see Jews, Protestants, and Hindus, a very small population of those. Those patients are of other religions, such as Jews, Protestants, and Hindus, find themselves at Buffalo Mercy, usually as the result of the hospital's transfer program. Um, Buffalo Mercy is the largest hospital in the area, offering services that some of the other hospitals don't. So they come from Niagara Falls or Lewiston from Kenmore Mercy and Mount St. Mary's. There are a lot of times in my work where I see Barbara scanning outside of the rooms and she's just very quiet into herself. 
And these are during like our code or resuscitation times or during a rapid response. And I asked her, I said, well, I noticed you, but what is it exactly that, you, that you're doing? And she said that she's praying for connectedness between the person, their spirit, and God. Connectedness was also a word that Barbara used a lot in our conversation. And um, she says that she helps or prays for that person to feel connected to God when they're in crisis or dying. We then had a little conversation about near-death experiences. This made her a little bit uncomfortable. She told me that she does not talk about this a lot. But when I did ask her if she ever had any of these types of experiences or if there was something that she could tell me about them, the word that she used was that she gets a sense, not always, but sometimes she gets a sense of the spirit leaving the body. Um, she also told me that there have been times where patients will talk to her about dream, dreams that they had um, of seeing dead family members, which is consistent with what we talked about in your class. So then I wanted to um, transition into asking her about if she believed in physician-assisted suicide. And Barbara told me that um, the, Catholic faith, the Catholic faith does not believe in that, but that she did and um, her beliefs were that it's okay to allow for natural death, but not to expedite it. Then we moved on to the topic of suicide and helping families cope with suicide. And she had said to me that there is suffering in suicide. Suffering isn't necessarily bad. Uh, people commit suicide because of free will. And she helps families understand that their feelings are normal and that God gives us free will, but he also gives forgiveness and redemption. This too is also very consistent with what we talked about in your class. So then I asked her, I said, Barb, what's the most difficult thing you have to deal with as a hospital chaplain? And I didn't think about this, so this kind of threw me off. And she told me that the unexpected death of a newborn, it's supposed to be a happy time, but when it's not, there's much grief. Fetal demise in the labor and delivery unit is the most difficult type of death for me to deal with, she told me. I don't ever try to answer the question of why. I comfort listen and I'm attentive to the parents or the mother. I try to be in solidarity with their suffering. She also told me that she provides grief counseling after discharge. So then I asked her to give me some final thoughts um, about what we can learn and something that she might, might want to share. And she told me to be aware of the patient and family's emotions and body language, be fully present and attentive. She said that there's times when not everybody wants to be touched or consoled or even talked to, but she makes it a point to let families know that she's there and she's present if they do need her, if they do want somebody to talk to. And then as far as um, caregivers, she said, be aware of your own emotions. It's okay to separate yourself from your work sometimes. That's self-preservation. She did say to take time to be quiet and reflect on your thoughts actions and emotions. So we had a lovely conversation and um, I really did enjoy talking to her. And I thought all of her answers and the way that she explained things were very re relevant to everything that we've done in the class. So it was, it was a very good opportunity for me to sit and talk to her because I've never really had a conversation with her. Great. That was it. Awesome, Melanie. Uh, you know, thank you for a great and informative uh, presentation. So, so how long have you have you known this chaplain? Well, I've known Barb for about 11 years. I worked at the hospital for 20, it'll be 24 in May. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I've been a nurse there for 12. You, you should be teaching this class. <laughs> no, oh. I shouldn't be teaching this class. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. it, interestingly enough, um, Barb and I work side by side but we don't really work together and we've never really had the opportunity to sit down and talk. So even though we knew each other, we've never really had that opportunity. So it was good, it was nice. It was nice to get to know her. Awesome. Well, unfortunately we ran out of time, so I, I can't ask you any more questions right now. So okay. maybe later. 
Um, but but let's why don't we uh, start a review? But, but great job. So uh, thank you so much, um, Melanie. So round of applause for our first review. For, for those of you who just came in, we just finished our first review, and now we'll begin our um, uh, presentation. Okay. I mean, I'm sorry. Our uh, uh, review, and then we'll get to our presentation. So would you mind please starting your videos? Can you guys hear me? Yep. Let me uh, unmute all of you. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 Good. Okay, good. So please start your videos. I am. Uh, Tara, nice cat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Our the stray kitten right, so had cats in my kittens in my office, so. Yeah. No problem. My my uh can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yep, for some reason my, my video keeps getting just freezing. So I'm gonna shut it off for a while and I'll try it again. Um uh, if you can't hear me, just raise your hand or something so I know. But let's let's just jump right into the review. So we're looking at uh review for your final review. Um and before actually before we get to your final review, you know, please if you haven't already, push up those uh final papers. You have quite a few final presentations, but if you're not presenting today or tomorrow and you're doing a paper, so uh, you know, please pay attention to that, those due dates. Um, in terms of your exam, it'll be just like your um, midterm exam. There'll be two parts to the exam. The first part will be your multiple choice and true-false, just like your midterm exam. So 50 minutes, 50 questions, and that'll cover everything uh, from Tibetan Buddhism up until uh, and including uh, the, the lecture and the readings on suffering, which you should be completing this this week if you stick with the schedule. Okay. Uh, there will also be questions from that first lecture, in particular Charles Kaur, Kuba Ross, Ross, sorry, uh, Bowlby and Parks, in particular, especially Charles Kaur. We talked a lot about Charles Kaur. I mean, by now you should know his task by heart. Um, and when we get to the second part of the exam, the essay exam, you know, pay attention to his theory because undoubtedly you, or well, it's highly likely that you will be asked to apply course, course uh, method to care for one of the world religions. Okay, and that brings us a great segue to our second part of the exam. So we have a multiple choice part. Um, you have, I believe I set it up from the fourth to the fifth. So it opens up on midnight of the fourth, and then we'll close at 11.59 on the fifth. So basically two full days to take uh, the exam. You could take it side to side, you could take it back to back, you could take one on the fourth, and the other on the fifth. Second part of the exam is your essay. Just like your midterm exam, it'll be in a, somewhat of an open-ended question, but basically asking you to apply uh, the material that we learned uh, in class this semester, okay? And by the way, there is a question there on the presentation, so highly encourage you to stick around for these presentations if you can't, and we might, we're probably going to be here late tonight, which is okay. Uh, I will post this tomorrow on your Moodle, so just make sure you, you look through them. Um, I sent you in an email the topics for the exam, and you get a lot of topics on those interviews, and even with the interviews, I'll essentially be asking you to apply a hospice care, or more specifically, apply Charles Court to one of these religious traditions, uh, incorporating in your answer uh, what Imam, Imam Chawla or uh, what uh, Rabbi uh, Lazarus Klein or what Father Peter Drilling had to say about their respective religious tradition. Okay, it's 25 minutes. One essay question will be randomly generated on one of those topics that I gave to you. So let's go and get into nuts and bolts. Any questions about the format of the exam itself? Um, I just wanted to clarify, when did you do the exam? Um, I, believe, I mean, let me look at my Moodle page so I don't. On Wednesday the 4th, it opens at midnight and it closes Saturday, May 6th at 11.59. Yeah. It, it's a, oh, yes. Yeah. Well, on the Moodle page, what class is this? I think I listed the fifth to the sixth. Yes. So it'll be the fifth to the sixth, whatever it says on the Moodle page right there. Okay. Okay, because okay, the final exam, like the actual 
testing on the final exam says it opens. This quiz will not be available until Thursday, May 4th at midnight, and it will close Saturday, May 6th at 1159. Okay, well, let's go with the date that that's been up there since the beginning. So I'll I'll fix that if your class okay. that. Okay, I just okay. want to make sure. Uh, not a problem. So we'll stick with the dates that I've been on here since uh, day one. So, so we'll so fifth to the sixth. So that means that we won't be able to take the exam until Saturday. Whatever the fifth is, I'm bad with dates. Friday. The fifth is Friday. So does it open like midnight? So if it opens on the fifth. It would open on midnight on Friday. Okay. So you could take it, you know, one o'clock in the morning or whatever okay. on Friday. So you have all day Friday and all day Saturday. Okay. okay. Yep. Thank you. All right. I saw a question on the, in the chat room. Um, yeah. So if you made a presentation, your presentation is due today. If you wrote a paper, then you have until that original due date. Okay which is the uh, seventh. You got a few more days to finish up those papers. Okay? And then I will try to have everything graded uh, by the end of next week so you know your stand. And I, I, you, if you haven't already, please look at your grade book. Uh, you should know exactly where you stand. I've been updating those grades as they've been coming in. Um, I have not finished your posts. And they're, and they're very, very good. Maybe we should talk about some of those posts uh, today especially the, the last post on on, uh, on suffering. Uh, but I, I will get that done uh, in the next day or so. Okay? I, I, I think the last question struck a chord with a few of you, which, which is good, very good. So let's get into your questions about uh, the course material uh, before we start our presentations. Any questions for me? I was curious about how the, in the study guide, the how I will apply the course material in my career slash life, if that's more of an open-ended question. That, that's, that's the easy A question. I always throw the easy A question in there. So. Okay. So that's, that, that's where I want you to just tell me about what you learn, you know, and, cool. and how you can apply it to your life, right? So for a lot of you, it's, you know, you're going to healthcare, so this course is for you. Uh, for others of you, I mean, maybe, I don't know, it made you think more critically or whatever. Okay. Um, uh, but so, yeah, that, that, that is in the round of questions. Thank you. I was wondering if I missed a section in the book or something. No, like no, that. no. Okay. Thank you. Don't overanalyze it. Deal. Yep. Uh, Jenna, are you still with us? Jenna? I guess not. All right. Uh, any other questions? Can you go over the bathing rituals for Islam? Okay, let me let me just pull that up. That's probably the easiest thing to do. I think I have it. Open. All right. All right. So I'm going to share my screen now with you. Oh no. Your computer just lost snap. <laughs> it, it said that. Oh, that's not good. Um, well, is there, as I'm loading this up, is there a specific question you had? No, like I kind of getting the Jewish religion and the Islam ones confused in my head. You know what's really interesting about that? That's actually a great point. Uh, they're very similar in terms of their uh, end of life rituals and preparation for the body. And, and really, what the, the biggest difference is just the the, uh, the terminology. In both in both uh, traditions, um, the, the same gender would do the washing. In both traditions, there is a, a shrouding ritual. Um, and in both traditions, because you know they generally do not uh, believe in embalming, uh, the funeral has to happen very quickly, and they generally do not believe in cremation. So you have to put the body in the ground. Know, very, uh, very, very quickly. So, so you're right to be confused because they're very, very similar, which you know, is kind of ironic because in, in, at least in the news you think of, you know, uh, Judaism and Islam is totally di different and, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, almost ad in an adversarial relationship. But, but you're right to say that it's very, very similar. Um, let's cross our fingers. As I'm pulling this up, 
Uh, any other questions? Uh, Dr. Sisto? Yes, is that you, Joe? Yeah, it is. Um, about our final paper, are we, yeah. can we expect to have the grades after the due date then? Or when can we expect the grades to be posted? <laughs> So give me a break, man. I got like two hundred final exams and two hundred papers coming. I I will uh, end of the week, like next week, end of next week, end of next week. You know, give me a. <laughs> no, that's okay. totally cool. Yeah, totally it, cool. it'll it'll take some time. It'll t it'll take some time. No problem. Um, it, it, if you're itching, I've been grading them as they come in. So some of your papers are already graded, but you're not going to see the papers until um, everyone's graded. So feel free to stop by my my office. Um, All right. It's, I didn't get to yours yet, though, Joe. Sorry. No, it's it's not definitely critical. I was just curious. <laughs> definitely no critical. Problem. Definitely critical. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's get back to uh, Islam. So after death, we have a shrouding ritual, we have a washing ritual. Um, it's considered so, like in Judaism, it's considered a, a commandment to take part of to take part in these rituals. Uh, in Islam, it, it's a uh, more of a meritorious act. It's considered a great good. In many of your mosques, like in the mosque, uh, the mosque in um, the Shiite mosque on Transit Road here in Buffalo, what they'll do is they'll get men from uh, the local community. Uh, well, if it's, if, it's a male, if it's a male that has died, uh, they will have uh, men wash the man, as well as if it's a woman that died, they'll have women wash watch the woman. And there's a video here, which I don't want to play, I don't want to mess with my bandwidth, but it goes through the actual process of uh, the shrouding. And what's really interesting is in this tradition, uh, it's very, very important to go through these rituals. Very, very important. Uh, it's considered a, I guess you would say a great sin if these are avoided. Uh, the exception would be a, a martyr, right? If, if you died for uh, an important cause, you know, if you were a martyr, um, you will be buried in the uh, garb in which you died, bloodied and everything. And the, the, the rationale there is that at the day of judgment, you will stand before your accusers, you know, kind of like a aha, ha, a, an aha moment. This is what you did to me. And now you will pay, um, you know, the consequence. You know, for, for killing a righteous martyr. Um, and then, yes, is there a question? Uh, does Judaism does Judaism leave martyrs in the same clothing as well, or is that only for Islam? Um, I don't recall, Joe. Okay. And uh, certainly in Reform Judaism, that would not be the case. Okay. Uh, in Orthodox Judaism, I, I would have to I would have to think about that. Okay. Uh, my my gut reaction is no, and so this is one difference between the end of life rituals. In in Judaism, number one, it's a commandment, but you're really doing it out of respect for your loved one. So it's said that the same respect that you show people during life, you should extend that respect to the person uh, in the dirt in the dying process, and then once they have died. Um, in Islam, however, I mean, these these rituals almost have a, a grace or like they actually help you in the afterlife, right? So it's not simply an issue of respect. Uh, it's an issue of uh, doing the will of Allah and uh, helping the soul transition to its to, to the barqsa. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, cause, cause, and, and by the way, so a lot of... Uh, students usually get confused or caught up on Judaism or out of all the religions, Judaism tends to be the most difficult for students, uh, which is sort of ironic because, you know, most students come from a Judeo-Christian background, right? And, and the main reason why it's, it's difficult for students to wrap their minds around uh, is because Judaism is the only religion in this class that we have discussed uh, where, uh, you know, around one third of them, one, one third of those who consider themselves uh, Jews do not believe in an afterlife, right? I mean, you could be a faithful Jew and not believe in an afterlife, right? Uh, why? Because in that tradition, you stress the uh, Torah 
and faithfulness to the Torah. And the Torah makes really no mention of, of the afterlife. It's more of a this world kind of religion, at least based in, in the Torah alone. Uh, and, 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 and you see this in the end of life rituals. You do have some rabbis uh, that will look at more of a theological and spiritual meaning to these rituals. But as the text is written, when you look at the halakha, the Jewish laws, uh, you know, that that's not clear, the, these theological or spiritual rituals. A lot of times Jews are doing this because this is what you do as a, as a Jew. Um, uh, Peter just uh, emailed me. Uh, hey, Peter, uh, if you can hear me, uh, just log in and, and log, log out and log back in. That should help. Um, and use uh, Google Chrome. That should help as well. All right. So, so, so any other questions? So to help, with, I, I don't remember. Elizabeth, did you ask that question about Islam and Judaism? My, my camera got messed up. No, it's me, Katie. Okay, okay, Katie. Did, did that help? It does, yeah. It's very similar, so. Yeah, yeah. And and also tie, tying to the um, final exam, uh, we mentioned these terms orthodoxy versus orthopraxy. And so please tell me, it's a quick review. What is uh, orthopraxy? Again? Correct practice. Come on now. Yeah, correct practice, right? And orthodoxy is uh, stress on belief. Um, in Judaism? Come on, Joe, what's up? Let's go. <laughs> uh, in Islam and uh, Judaism, uh, the stress, so they certainly have orthodox teachings. But the stress is certainly on orthopraxy. I mean, think about it. Why, why do all the why did the Jewish community one third of them uh, do not believe in the afterlife? But they're doing these rituals because it's what you do in that religion. It's part of it. It's very it's a religion of stress. It's the practice of the religion, uh, much like Buddhism and, and Islam as well. Uh, although there are, without a doubt, doctrinal beliefs. It's very different when we get to like Christianity, where. Um, you know, even in Christian traditions where, where there is a strong tradition and a strong and a lot, a lot of uh, rituals, uh, that they tend to be more uh, uh, laid back, if I, if I do say, uh, as opposed to other religions. Because the stress is on not so much what you do, but what you believe. Okay? So, Kanisha uh, just asked a question. Hey, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, Panisha just asked me a question. How is Jihad the sixth pillar? Uh, how is Jihad the sixth pillar different from the five pillars of Islam? So, yeah, so it, it's, it's really interesting that in Islam you have the, the five pillars of Islam, uh, the five really uh, basic things that all Muslims should do. You know, you have fasting, jihada, this profession of faith. And by the way, one of the reasons why I would argue Islam is the orthopraxis faith is look at the five pillars of Islam. Um, really only one of those pillars, only one of those pillars is orthodox in terms of belief. Um, the other pillars, like the Salat, is a, is a holy, um, not so much a holy tax, but, but almsgiving, you're called to give alms, you're called to make a, uh, you know, a, a pilgrimage, um, you're called to fast you know, during Ramadan. But when we get to this sixth pillar of jihad, what does that mean? Well, you have probably all have heard of jihad. I mean, where have you heard of jihad before, before this class? Uh, on the news and South Park. Yeah, right. And, and, what, and what is and, and Holy war. Holy war, right? And that's actually a part of Islam. There's no denying that. But at, in terms of the pillar of Islam, and some are arguing, with some argue as, as jihad is a pillar of Islam, what they're saying is, uh, yes, there are times where you have to fight for your faith, right? There's a whole question of whether or not uh, you could be a faithful Muslim and a pacifist, uh, but that's for a different discussion. But the greater jihad is jihad of heart, right? And for faithful Muslims, that means continuously um, submitting your will to Allah. Okay. So, so by by the by the sixth pillar, that's what we're talking about. This this faith that. Uh, comes from your heart, this deep love of, of God and deep trust in God's mercy, and it, that, that includes 
a total submission of uh, yourself to Allah. Okay, so uh, someone asked me, let's stick with the Islamic question. Someone asked me, I think it was Chelsea, uh, can you go into detail on the, on the Sunnah relating to Muhammad and how Muhammad occupies the role uh, or how the Sunnah imitates Muhammad? Thank you. Okay, so the Sunnah, so, so in terms of Islam, you have the Quran, which is kind of like the Bible, if you're coming for Judeo-Christian tradition, for, for Muslims. Uh, but then you also have these teachings, uh, which are believed to come from the Prophet Muhammad himself, called the Hadiths. Okay? Uh, and then you have uh, people who have applied these Hadiths over time to particular you know, situations. Right? Uh, the Hadiths themselves are also called the Sunnah. And so the Sunnah is basically, or the Sunnah is believed to be the actual teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. So if you read the Quran, and if you do a Google search, just do a, open the Quran, do a, do a, uh, no, a, con, a control F, search for Muhammad. Depending upon your translation, he'll come up three to five times. It's a thousand page book. And there's only three to five references to the name Muhammad. Um, if you know the story of Muhammad, there, there are a few places where it's, it's implied that this is who we're talking about, but it's not clear at all. How do we learn about this guy, Muhammad? What did he do? What did he say? How do you apply uh, Islam to daily life? Well, that's where the Sunnah comes in. This is where the, the Hadiths come in. Um, so that's, that, that's what we're, we're talking about there. So I, I think I mentioned in the lecture that you know, for a Muslim, you know, for, for Christians, uh, Christians are called to follow Christ. Well, well, Muslims are called to imitate Muhammad. He's the perfect person. Um, and in fact, they would argue, you know, we can go to the Hadiths. We can go to this, this body of works called the Sunnah, the, these teachings of Muhammad, to figure out how to actually live out Islam today. So they actually just talk more about the Sunnah verse Muhammad? Well, it's not really verse because the... The, the Sunnah is believed to be the teachings of Muhammad. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Like the Sunnah is not a person. The Sunnah is a body of works that he's believed to have uh, said and that later on was written down. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, Stephen just asked me, can you explain the resurrection in uh, Islam? I'm confused as to how Allah resurrects humanity after he has destroyed all creation in the cosmos, even death itself. Yeah, well, I don't get the confusion now. Uh, in the Islamic tradition, just like all the Western traditions we talked about, there's a, a firm belief in the resurrection. But there are a series of events that happens before. You have uh, an apocalyptic event. You have the Al-Dajjal, which is translated in English as the Antichrist. Then you have the, the Mukti, which in English would be translated as the Messiah. Uh, many Muslims believe to be is Jesus Christ himself. Uh, so despite in popular belief, actually in, in, I know Muslims aren't um, anti-Jesus or against Jesus. In fact, in Islam, Jesus is uh, perhaps the second or third most important person. Right? At the end of time, for many Muslims, he's believed to be uh, the Messiah. But he certainly, in every Islamic tradition, he plays a role at the end of time. He does come back. And there's this battle. Um, and then after all this has happened, it's believed that Allah recreates everything. And first, Allah destroys everything. And there's, in that video, or in that prezi, I, I, I give you a, uh, a, a video. It's from a... a uh, the preaching of this particular imam. It's very passionate. He, he has excerpts from uh, uh, one of those apocalyptic movies. And you see the world being destroyed, and he even destroys the angel of death himself. And then he recreates everything. And in that recreation, uh, all the souls in the Barksa, uh, all the souls who you know, were destroyed um, on earth, etc., they, they, they come back and they get their bodies back. And then there's this uh, judgment period where they, 
at least in the tradition that's popularized by this Islamic theologian, the Sunni theologian, uh, Al-Ghazali, they, they actually walk, is believed to walk to uh, Israel. And in Israel, there's this final judgment where you cross the bridge of Surat, which is as thin as a razor, and you wear all the sins around your neck that you've done. Well, the good, actually the good and the, and the bad deeds. And then you're, you're questioned and judged by God. Um, so that, that, that's the resurrection in a, or where the resurrection falls uh, into play in the Islamic tradition with regard to their eschatological or their belief in the end time events. Okay. If you guys have, um, your, if your audio is working, please ask questions as opposed to typing because it is kind of hard to follow all the uh, messages. I'm afraid I missed some already. Um, Can you hear me? Question. Hold on. Who, who was that? Ryan Alexa. or? Alexa. Sorry. Yeah, she can go first, but I was just making sure you could hear me. I have a question after her. Okay. Oh, you can go. Sorry. No, it's all right. You can go first. Well, it was back to the um, Judaism and yes. um, the preparation of the body. I think you were saying that cremation is not allowed, but then there was that interview yeah, with the rabbi. Like that. And he well, said he that, like, cremation is allowed. So why would they bother to prepare the body for, like, cremation anyways? <laughs> so so what he said was, just a quick qualification. So, so in the tradition itself, in the normative tradition, cremation is not allowed. Uh, the rabbi himself is from a reform tradition, which within Judaism, so within any religion, you have, you know, you have the spectrum. Like, hey, you, know, you have liberal Democrats, more conservative Democrats. You have liberal Republicans, you know, etc. In in Judaism, you have uh, liberal progressive Jews, and you have certainly more conservative Jews. Reformed are on the very very progressive side. So in that tradition, they have embraced cremation more and more, much like most Americans, right? Uh, and actually, the, interesting enough, one of the reasons why cremation is becoming more permissible is because of the Holocaust. Because many Jews say, well, wait a minute. We get we don't do cremation, but the Nazis killed six, killed half our population. Like it, and, I mean, many of them were children. They just threw it. Like, they, they threw children into furnaces. Like, we know this, right? The Nazis is a furnace that was specifically used to burn children to death. What happened to them, right? It, 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 and for them, for more progressive Jews, it, it kind of just makes the whole prohibition on cremation sort of silly. Because if, you, if you're saying this is a horrible thing to do, then our, what does that mean for these kids and their families uh, that died in this way? So it's becoming more, more okay. acceptable. But that, that's, you're, you're definitely not going to find that in an Orthodox or even a conservative um, Jewish rabbi. So it's more just a way to respect the people that had died in the Yes. The, that, that began the, the openness to cremation. But, but today it is, it is growing. Yeah. Okay. But within the within the more liberal or progressive okay. forms of Judaism, okay. Okay. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Ryan. Well, that you know, you sent that out with the final exam topics. Those are all the essay topics. Yes. It's like the the father drill interview and the mom stuff yes, interview. Sir. I'm just, sure. just like kind of clarify things, and then the final exam notes are pretty much what's going to be on the test. All right, I'm just double checking, and then. Can you like yeah. kind of like differentiate the like Orthodox branch of Judaism from the other branches? Like, what's like the main like what are their main differences? I know they um, after I think after somebody passes away, I think they they stay inside and longer and like uh, I can't remember the name like but um Shiva sitting Shiva yeah Shiva like I think they yeah. they like they more I don't know. Well, yeah, you know, so in terms of this class, in terms of end of life or end of life rituals, um, they're actually very similar. So think of it this way: all Jews uh, do these end of life rituals. It's very, very important. And you use this book called the Halakha, which, which is basically Jewish law. And it's and I actually have I got a book for um, the, the the library at the U book. If you want to check it out, it's like it's like a Bible. I mean, it's like a thousand pages that goes through all the different laws. Of what you should do. I mean, if you know how, how what, what as, as specific as how to clean the person, or what do you do if you know there's uh, the person dies and their clothing falls to the floor, how to how to dispose of that, or, or 
you know, whatever. So for a Reformed Jew, they see the halakha as more of a, a guide, right? And they're more interested in the spirit of the halakha, okay? So they, they tend to see it more as a basic guidelines of what you could do. And if you want to be, you know, if you want to read it literally, yeah, you could do that or, or just see it more as uh, a, a kind of how to do this, especially if you get confused or you, you need some help. For an Orthodox Jew, which would be certainly on the, uh, maybe the most conservative or a very, very conservative branch of Judaism, that you follow the halakha by the T, right? I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I've heard, you, I mean, Hasidic Jews as well, you follow the halakha by, by the T. So you read the halakha and, and you do exactly what it says uh, as closely as possible. So when we talked earlier about cremation, yeah, you're not going to see an Orthodox Jew participating in that, at least willingly. <laughs> there would definitely be some yeah. problems uh, within at least the communities here in, here in Buffalo. Um, and that's because they respect the body so much because like Yahweh or the, the Yahweh's... Yeah, it, it goes, it goes yeah. back to Yahweh. When you come from the earth, like the whole creation uh, myth of the Genesis account, God creates Adam and Eve from, from the earth. It's actually very beautiful. And then when you die, you return to earth, right? And this is this is the plan of God and plan for your body. So you don't, you don't, you know, mess with that. It's this like all God. natural. Yeah. So that, that, that's okay. why you know, uh, you, you don't embalm and you don't do anything silly, or like like for them, like flowers. Flowers at funerals for a Jew, uh, especially an Orthodox Jew, is is just considered. I don't want to say offensive, but sort of silly. Like, why would you kill more things to? Celebrate death. It doesn't. Yeah. You know, but Judaism is about celebration of, of life. That's what they would say. Thank Does you. Help? Yeah, yeah okay, definitely. I have a question. Yes, Ashley. Um, so, what is the difference between the pre um, exilic and post exilic for in Judaism for Sheol? Oh, Sheol. Yes, I saw that. Sorry. That, that was one well, of the questions. I knew I, I, knew I missed something. Try and jump on when my sound got all better. Uh, perfect. Yeah, so, so Sheol is. Uh, so as Judaism begins, there really isn't a belief in the afterlife that we know of the Torah. But there is this term that's used very ambiguously called Sheol. Okay. So in the pre-exilic time, Sheol, and by the way, for the exile, so just I go over the history of Judaism, but, but for this class, uh, you be, Judaism begins with this prophet named Abraham. He comes from what would be Mesopotamia, you know, uh, the land of Ur, and he's brought by God to through Egypt and to Israel, he founds, uh, he starts a family there, and uh, his his tribes, his his, uh, his sons have more sons, and eventually you have the tribes of the, the various families in Israel called the tribes of Israel, the twelve tribes in Israel, uh, and then you, and then there's some problems, right? They get you know sent to Egypt, uh, there's a famine, and then you, most of you are familiar with Moses. Um, you know, uh, DreamWorks made that really neat movie a long time ago. Uh, I forgot what it's called, but it's a Moses movie. Definitely should watch it, my favorite Moses, Moses movie. Uh, and so anyway, they, they come back back into Israel, but the Jews keep messing up. Uh, they ask for a king, they get a king, uh, but the kings do some horrible things. And so eventually God pulls blank. I was like, all right, you want to do it your way? Go do it your way. Uh, Israel is split, and the northern kingdom is, con the, the northern kingdom is conquered, and then finally, the southern kingdom is con conquered, which is most of the tribe of Judah. And they're brought to Babylon. So that's called the exile, right? Mm -hmm. So belief up until that point in Sheol uh, was, was basically, they didn't really stress the afterlife that much. It was very similar to Mesopotamia, uh, like an underworld, another world. We all go there, right? And so when you look at uh, Second Kings, there's a famous example of this uh, where uh, the first king, Saul, he, um, he doesn't know what to do. He's scared, and he wants Samuel back, this great prophet. And so he goes to a medium, he goes to, which is known as, popularly known as the, the Wish of Endor. He goes to this witch to conjure him up, and she conjures him up. Um, and he says to him, well, you will be with me tomorrow in, in, in this place in Sheol, right? So Saul's a really bad guy. He winds up committing suicide, which is a horrible sin in Judaism. Um, 
they're going to be this great profit. I mean, it, so there's, there's, there's some sort of notion that they're going to be in this amorphous kind of gray place. When we get past the exile, when Jews really start looking at more, um, more astutely at issues of justice, right? Like, what happens to bad people when they die? What happens to good people? Those questions start uh, coming to the fore. And then we get prophets like the prophet uh, Daniel. Uh, Sheol becomes uh, hell, what we would uh, say to as uh, hell. Uh, there's various layers to it, but whatever. But it, it's, not, it's not a fun place to be. And, and there, that, that's when we get to Daniel. You do have a clear teaching on resurrection, as well as a clear teaching on, on heaven and hell. Okay. okay. Yeah, that, perfect. That thank you. Hey, can, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can. Is that you, Peter? Yeah. Yep, shoot. Um, I think I, the the Hasidic Jews believe in um, reincarnation. Are you asking me a question or are you telling me they believe in reincarnation? Yeah, I was confused as to like how that branch of Judaism, like some of them, or at first we were saying how like they don't believe in any afterlife or push that, but then like this branch believes in reincarnation. I feel like that's a pretty like... <laughs> See, yeah, and I, yeah, so <laughs> it's complicated. Uh, so, so we're looking at like 16 million Jews today. There are various beliefs, but but the when we're talking about the afterlife, what we have to be clear about is for for most Jews, and within the Jewish tradition, the afterlife just isn't stressed. Period. Even 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 in Hasidic tradition or, or the or the uh, um, Kabbalistic traditions, the afterlife isn't stressed. In the Hasidic tradition and in the Kabbalah uh, tradition, particularly this book called the Torah, the Zora, Zora, which is about a thousand years old, uh, give or take two centuries, um, there we have a, a teaching on reincarnation. And, and so, right about 800 years to 1,000 years ago, reincarnation enters into Jewish belief in the, in the afterlife. Um, Today, Reform Jews are, you know, uh, who, who are basically relearning their tradition. Um, they would be, they're, they're taught, at least in this particular um, synagogue that I attended here in, uh, here in Williamsville, uh, that there is, there is a heaven, there is a hell, uh, but there also is this, this reincarnation. Now, it's very, very different than what we've learned in terms of uh, Tibetan Buddhism or or um, or Hinduism, there's no belief in karma or samsara, but it's it's more or less this notion of uh, you still have more work to do, right? So if you have more work to do, more more justice to do, more good things to do on this in this life, then you return and become more of a of a, a full person. But in, in the Hasidic tradition, uh, yes, I, reincarnation is, is is a normative tradition. Whereas, let's say in the Reform tradition or the Conservative tradition, um, it's just one of many uh, afterlife beliefs that aren't stressed. I mean, mo most Jews that I know have no idea that uh, there are Jews in their tradition that believe in reincarnation. Thank you. You're welcome. Did that help? Yeah, I was just because when we were writing the uh, previous form, I was kind of like all over thinking like, well, this group thinks otherwise. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, yeah. And, and any of these religions, one thing I'll say about the study of religion in general is be careful of generalizations. There are so many different, you know, nuances. Uh, uh, like and a Judaism is a, is a case in point. Individualized. Yeah. Well, just like, well, the stresses and uh, there are traditions that um, think of things in, or, th or have fr a framing of uh, ways of thinking that may not be um, congenial to our own or, or, or something you're familiar with. So just got to get into that mindset. Um, I have a quick question. Can you hear me? Yeah, Abby? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I have a quick question like, um, about like Judaism and then like, Christianity. I know that like, Christianity it. stresses a lot like being with Christ, like in the afterlife, like after you die, like looking yeah. forward to that, to that practice.
this. So in Judaism, like, do they not think that you are with Christ when you die if they don't stress the afterlife? So, uh, so Jews, most Jews, the vast majority of Jews do not recognize Christ as the Son of God, right? Um, mm-hmm. And, and uh, I, I think, you know, uh, m- many Jews would say he's a fraud. Uh, other Jews would say, oh, he was just a really important Jewish mm-hmm. teacher, uh, but the Christians messed him up. Uh, but but they but even those Jews now I, there, there is like a there is an offshoot group of, of Judaism it, it's very small but it's known as Jews for Christ they're actually mm-hmm. religious Jews like basically Orthodox Jews but they believe that Jesus Christ is uh, you know the Son of God so, so they, they might agree to that but the, just about uh, the vast majority of Jews uh, will do not believe you meet Christ in heaven okay not not at least in the way Christians do. He's not the Son of God. He's not the Savior for in Judaism. If they believe that, they'd be Christians, right? That's like the the, the belief that makes you a Christian. Um, so so what what do they believe? Well, again, as I was saying, is this isn't a stress in that tradition. And only recently, like it's just in the past ten years, we're seeing more and more books about uh, Jewish belief uh, in the afterlife. And and part of that is there's this really need amongst religious Jews to understand what happens when we die. We have things like near-death experiences becoming, um, you know, uh, well-known. We have all these different religions talking about the afterlife. You have atheists saying there's no afterlife. Well, what do Jews believe? And and with these questions, you're getting um, a variety of answers. So in this chapter, in that, in the lecture, I talk about this uh, Jewish theologian, uh, Simcha Raphael. And he'd be the closest you'd have to, to like a, a theologian of a, of the of Jewish afterlife, and he he gives a pretty good or a pretty solid overview of what what Jews what happens to a Jew when what Jews believe in the afterlife. And so, for many Jews who are thinking about what happens in the afterlife, they'll buy his book or they would believe something along those lines, in in heaven and in hell. But I want to stress, don't be surprised if your Jewish friends do not believe in an afterlife because that would be a, a legitimate, um, or, or certainly it, it's, it, it's about one-third of Jews today do not believe in an afterlife. Abby, would that, was that helpful? Yeah, yeah. So if they don't believe in an afterlife, or even if they believe in one, what, does, what would it consist of then, if it doesn't consist of being with God or with Christ? Uh, so you're asking, so... You're asking two different questions. If, if you don't believe in the afterlife, then that's it, right? So, for instance, mm-hmm. I have, I know of a man, he's a, he, he's, a, he's an Orthodox Jew, okay? Very, very devout. I mean, he, he's the kind of guy that, if you ever, if you ever, if you ever live around in Buffalo, um, you'll notice on Saturday, be it the summer or um, middle of the winter, you'll see people wearing lots of black. You know, walking towards a synagogue, right? They're not driving around, not using air conditioning. They're, they're an Orthodox Jew. During their high holy days, um, during, during Passover, I mean, that they celebrate until the evenings, late in the evenings. You'll see them walking out of the synagogue or out of their friends' homes at 11 p.m. See, he's, he's very devout. He doesn't believe in God, right? So he would say, now, now Jews do believe in God, but, but he would say there is no afterlife and there is no God. I, I just follow the, the traditions. Right. Um, I don't want to say that that's legitimate. I don't want to say that's that's norm. That's by no means normative. But you certainly do have, because there's such a stress and such a downplaying of uh, the theology of the afterlife, uh, that that's not uncommon to find. But it's by no means normative. Um, so Jews who do believe in an afterlife, and they would believe in something along the lines of Simcha Raphael, they believe that you. You die, and then uh, your body, your soul waits around for some time uh, you know, during these these rituals and funeral services, and then your soul enters into this kind of like a Christian lesser judgment. And um, in most cases, you still have sins to be purged, and you're sent to hell. Now, in in various Jewish writings, it talks about hell as a, a period of time, right? So whereas in Christianity and in Islam, hell is, by and large, and um, you know, you're, you're there for all eternity, and with the exception of the resurrection. Uh, in Judaism, uh, 
the, ma the major tradition is that it's, it's about a nine month period. So you're there, you're purified. It's kind of like Christian purgatory, actually. And then um, you come to these various levels of, of heaven where eventually you meet God. And for Jews who do believe in the re in reincarnation, they would say that after you go through this heavenly experience, you're kind of overjoyed and you want to you wanna help others to, to get here. Well, that's when you're reincarnated and you go through life again. So, does that help? Okay. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Hi, I have a question. Yes. Um, my question is in regards to the Tibetan Buddhism chapter. Okay. Um, you included a slide about the Tekdom state, which is basically intense meditation before becoming a Buddha. Um, so I wanted to know how could someone uh, be able to achieve that state? And once you achieve that state, would you definitely become a Buddha? Yeah, so, <laughs> well, how do you know? Well, I mean, I don't know. I, I never achieve the state, so. Uh, but in, in that tradition, they, there is belief that um, there are signs that someone is on their way towards Buddhahood, right? And, and one of the signs, so for most people, when they, for in Tibetan Buddhism, we're talking about now, when they die, um, you, know, you don't touch the body for three days because the soul is uh, basically being reanimated. It, it goes through, you know, that, that first bardo, right? It, it, it's kind of going inward. Right, it, it, as your senses are dissolving, and then it forms this ethereal body, then it goes to the next part. Oh. If you're a master, right, and you're already prepared for nirvana, you can stop that, and you can stay in that bardo. And there are um, there are legends that uh, persons have stayed in this state for weeks, for months, for years. So, so recent, I don't know if I include this in that lecture, but uh, I think about a year and a half ago, these archaeologists discovered this mummy, and it was this, it was a mummified monk. And many in the Tibetan community were uh, annoyed to say the least because these archaeologists were disturbing this this mummy. And their point was, yes, you know, for you know for the materialist, this person's dead; it's a mummy, but but. This body, you notice how it's kind of shriveled, no one tells it's kind of shrunken. There's a soul in there, and this person has been uh, in this intense state of meditation for almost a century, right? He's getting very close to achieving nirvana. Do not disturb him at all. Okay, so, so anyway, so where am I going? So, so they do have various traditions on signs that a person uh, is achieving uh, nirvana. So just like in Tibetan Buddhist tradition, um, when, the, when the person goes to that first bardo and their, their soul is um, coming apart, coming apart from the body and forming a, a new spiritual body, they'll look for signs that the person has died, right? And usually there's blood from the head, from the ears, uh, from the, the pubic area. Uh, they'll also be looking for signs, you know, if this person ha is, has achieved uh, you know, Buddhahood. So in, in some cases, there's one tradition that you can shrink the body. So if the person's body becomes like a, you know, like a, like a tiny little miniature, um, that's a sign that they achieved Buddhahood. Does, does that help? Yeah, but going back to the monk mummy, um, yes. do they go through the same process of mummification in order to be preserved, or do they just stay like that? Uh, you mean that the archaeologists discovered? Yeah. You know, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know that for sure. I think in this case, it was uh, this monk. So it's not uncommon for Tibetan masters who are, or Buddhist masters in general, particularly in Asia, who are near their death to um, prepare themselves in so much, in, in as far as they might go to a cave in like the Himalayas um, and, and just meditate essentially, you know, meditate themselves to death, right? They're essentially starving themselves to death, but they're, you know, they know that they're going to die, um, and they're in this intense state of um, meditation that eventually, you know, they, 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 they die in. Um, uh, I think the body's, uh, decomp it decomposes at a slower rate just because it's, 
you know, frozen solid after a while. Hello? Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. Good. You're welcome. Okay, great questions. Anyone else? So what are the um, Jewish views on hospice? The Orthodox probably wouldn't accept hospice, but would any branches accept hospice? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, in that lecture, um, so number one, there's actually a Jewish hospice. Because Jews are very, very specific on uh, their, uh, their needs towards the end of life, th there's a whole hospice ministry called Jewish hospice. Um, I, I, I almost, my, my memory is a little uh, slow right now, but I'm almost positive that there's a Jewish hospice uh, organization here in, here in Buffalo. So th they wouldn't have problems. I, now, certainly, uh, certainly reformed, even conservatives, I don't think would have problems. But uh, Orthodox, yeah, Hasidic would, would, would definitely have issues um, by using hospice. And I, I think the issue would be, especially if it's a female nurse and it's a male patient, that, that there might be some problems there uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the modesty issues. Okay. Uh, that's another important point that we haven't talked too much about is um, modesty. So we, we see this particularly in, in the Western religions, I mean, even the Eastern religions too, but, but it, it's very much stressed in Islam, uh, conservative forms of, of Judaism, and, and this is something that you know here in Buffalo uh, does does come up very often. You know, there's there's a growing. I, I was re listening to NPR, and this is the this has been the first year in I don't know how many years, uh, over a decade, that the population in the city of Buffalo has grown. Well, why has it grown? Refugees. Where are they coming from? Well, you know, uh, Asia, uh, the Middle East, Africa, but you know, primarily Muslim countries. We're getting a, a large influx in uh, Muslim immigrants uh, what a, and this is causing particularly in in uh, our hospitals and our healthcare, care uh, sometimes it causes stress for Muslim patients uh, because they're not or Western uh, hospitals or our hospitals uh, aren't really accustomed to to the modesty um, and, and how how much is the stress in these traditions the point where uh, you know you a, a, a tr traditional or conservative uh, Muslim woman would be um, find it very uncomfortable uh, with a male uh, nurse or a male doctor or a male uh, nurse practitioner helping them uh, to the point where if there's you know no occasion for a, a female to to help them uh, they most likely will have a uh, almost like a guardian or a, a, another woman in their family to, to stand and to be with them. Uh, I just had a, well, just real quick, I had a student, I don't know if I told you this before, but she emailed me maybe a, a few months or maybe a year after she took this course and she said, wow, and it, as well as great emails, like, well, I, I actually used what I learned in this course, and she was a nurse, um, and she told me that she had a uh, patient who was really angry, <laughs> and no one could figure out, like, what's, like, why is this guy being so problematic? He seemed like a really nice guy until he got here, uh, and it turns out the patient was, was Muslim, and it clicked in her head that through our, in, in this particular part of her hospital, all the nurses working on him cleaning him, taking care of him, were female. And uh, lo and behold, she asked, you know, the one male nurse from the uh, different floor to uh, come and help out and take care of this patient, and he did, and guess what? You know, the, the patient was much more congenial, it was much, much easier to work with. And that's what we're talking about, that, um, how important modesty is for, particularly for uh, Islamic patients. And, and keeping the, the sex uh, the same. I have a yeah. um, question about the the lack of division between church and state historically in Islam. Um, yeah. Do you find that that influences advanced directives or some of the legal side of dying that can come into the medical realm? 
uh, have those things would be addressed separately, generally, in our you know, American culture. Do you see that? I, I don't see it, no. Um, I could, without a doubt, seeing that, uh, seeing that conflict, especially with uh, first-generation Muslims from, who tend to be more from you know, conservative countries, right? So, uh, well, Tur uh, Turkey is, you know, very, very uh, secular as compared to um, Iran or, you know, northern Nigeria. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I have not seen that. That's not to say that does not occur. Um, and I, off the top of my head, I do not know if there's a particular school of Sharia. Um, so off the top of my head, I would think that, th that the problem with advanced directives uh, would be it conflicting with the will of Allah. I mean, if, if, you're planning, if you're planning out what you want to happen to you or what should happen to you in, in, the, in this case, how do you square that with this belief that we need to put all things, we need to submit all things to, to Allah? Um, and I, I think that would be the, the, the difficulty there. That's not to say that, uh, and I know many Muslims who, are, who don't have, you know, problems with that. You know, they, they would approach that in the same way that uh, Catholics you know, would, would approach that. There, there isn't a, a problem with, you know, uh, most advanced uh, directives. I mean, it, it's, it's actually good to have those conversations, you know, so that it's less stressful for your, your family when it comes time for your dying. That's a great, great question, man. I'll, I'll have to look into that. Thank you. Right. Welcome. I have something to say about that, actually. Yeah. Yes. I work in, I'm a nurse in an ER, and a lot of Muslims do come in with most forms with advanced directives. They are against okay. extraordinary means. So it's, they're against like intubation and DNRs if they already have, if they're in the process of dying, they just want to go because it is the will of Allah to die. And us Thank putting you. them on a ventilator is prolonging that. Oh, interesting. So you do see those advanced directives filled out, but in line course, with yeah. keeping church and state sort of, um, yeah. yeah, aligned in that way. Interesting. Thank you. That's really interesting. I have a question regarding theodicy. Yes, yes. Grant. So, so one of the exam topics is uh, theodicy. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about uh, theodicy and how you would ask it in an exam question. Why do good things happen to? Why do bad things happen to good people? Right. That, yeah. that, that's, a, that's a fundamental theological question. All religions have to have to deal with that. Uh, so expect to see something like that in that particular lecture. I go through. Uh, the Eastern perspective, which really is, frankly, isn't all that complicated. If you understand karma, then you can under, you'll understand um, that response. Whenever I meet a religious leader, I am, I'm, you know, I'm obviously, well, not obviously, but I'm very much fascinated by the question of, of evil and suffering, right? And I will always ask your religious leader, um, I'll, I'll give this personal example of my, my cousin, whose daughter uh, had Krebs disease, whose child suffered from the age of two healthy, same age as my son too. So it's always weird to have you know family reunions and here my son is healthy and growing, and their daughter, which is two months older than my son, no, she she's not here anymore. She died, and she had a very painful death. How do you explain that? Like, how would you explain how how do you explain this to her her parents? Uh, and in Eastern traditions, the, the answer is karma, right? Uh, this child, I have asked the Buddhist, a Buddhist master, that exact question, and his answer was very straightforward, straight face. You know, she made mistakes in a past life, and now she's atoned for it through the suffering that's happened. Um, and, and her parents too. This is a result of their karma. All this, all these karmas are related, um, and she'd be better off. And, and when I talked to a, a um, Hindu Brahmin, similar response. When you get to the, the Western religions, though, um, that's not going to jive because, you know, there, there isn't a belief in cause and effect. There isn't a belief in, in karma. In fact, there's this belief in this all-loving and powerful God. And how do you reconcile the belief or this reality, not belief, the reality of suffering, the reality of uh, innocent children dying of horrible, horrible diseases uh, with an all-powerful and, and loving God. Uh, 
And so I, I go through some of the Islamic responses, but then I go in depth uh, to the Christian responses. Frankly, they, they've written the most on this. They've been talking about this for 2,000 years. And uh, what you want to focus on there, if, if you get a, how would a Christian respond to this? You want to look at one of those theories. So I give you the perspective theory, the prospective theory, the evolutionary theory, the phenomenological theory, as well as a little bit of, of the free will in general. Um, and, and essentially, for the Christian, all, all of this comes down to free will. For God to love us uh, fully and completely, and to, and to make us in a way that we could love God, we could actually be capable of love, not, not robots. We have to have a choice, right? And with the choice, you have the reality of uh, not choosing God. And that's the, that's the birth of the possibility of evil, which unfortunately has become a reality. And that, Christians will say, especially followers of the perspective theory, or even, even the evolutionary theory, would say that has uh, cosmological or, the, or that has effects beyond, you know, simply our, um, the, 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 our, our immediate sphere of influence, right? Gotcha. You know, so, so there's some theologists that are looking at uh, epigenetics. And epigenetics is this belief that our, essentially your, to dumb it down, choices, actions can shut on or off particular genes that are then passed on through generations, right? Yep. And so it's, for, for a, a, a Christian, it's like, well, this is kind of like the original sin. Um, but now we have some science to back it up. Um, but that's for a different class, unless you want to get into that. I actually have a question about the yes. original sin. Um, so, like, for the primitive theory, it said that the end of evil is, like, connected to the redemption of humankind. But, like, what does that entail exactly? Christ. <laughs> so just, like, embracing, like, God's will and, like, I don't know. Well, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking, but let me try to answer it. And if I'm wrong, I'll do it again. But, well, I think the Christian response in that particular theory um, is that with this original sin that's perpetuated over and over again, right? We're talking about epigenetics, it, it's, it's this really very bad decision that is not only um, so. For, so, for original, so what are we talking about? If any of you have ever had an alcoholic in your family, right? Or maybe you've been alcoholics, right? Um, you know exactly what the doctrine of original sin is. And it's basically that you are, you are living in a, a very difficult situation that, that isn't uh, of your own making. Like if your father is an alcoholic, right? He's, the sin of your father's alcoholism is not your sin, but you have to deal with it. You know, dad gets drunk at a party, um, you know, you have to drag him off the floor, put him in the backseat of the car and drive him home. Get him out, on, dress him and put him into his bed, right? I mean, you got to deal with it. Uh, that, that, that's the, the original sin uh, in a nutshell. That this bad, this, these bad decisions are perpetuated over and over again. And um, they become a part of our, our society. Now, now we have structures. We have societies that are built on uh, oppressing people, on doing things that are irrational uh, and, you know, just, just not bad for people. Uh, sins perpetuate over and over again. So how do we get out of this? And human beings can't do it by themselves, right? Only God can get us out of this. But, but God doesn't, um, God, you know, God could just flick a switch and it'd be over with. But God doesn't want to infringe on our free will in any way. Because the free will is, is the greatest gift we have. So the way in which God gets us out of this out of this mess is to fully and totally embrace it. And he does that in the person of Jesus Christ. He fully and totally embraces our dad's alcoholism. He fully and totally embraces all the bad stuff that's happened, all the evil in the world. Uh, but as God, he overcomes it, right? And, and so that when you, when you, so for a Christian, this actually goes back to even the questions about how, uh, how Catholics, you know, or the spiritual tax task in terms of how Catholics die or how Christians die. Uh, they take solace and they take comfort in the fact that Christ conquered it. Christ took on sin 
and redeemed us. He gave us a way out of it. Uh, not only through his example and teachings, but through his assistance, right? Um, and so like Easter Sunday, that just was celebrated a few Sundays ago, is the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus overcoming the, the, the most horrible result of sin, which is, which is death itself. Um, does that help, Caitlin? Yeah, that does. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you explain how the uh, essay question will relate to the presentation? I'm going to ask you a question on one of the presentations. Yeah. Any <laughs> so random I'll say, only the good ones. Uh, so no, they're all great. So I'll say, hey, you know, uh, Stephanie had this marvelous presentation. Um, what did you think of? I, actually, I won't mention names, but about, I will mention. Um, you may you may see a essay question that mentions a title of an essay of one of the presentations, and just tell me about it. What did you learn? What didn't you learn? Or what what did what did you learn from this presentation? Um, and critique the presentation. That, that, that's what I'm looking for. Okay. Okay. What about the presentation that already happened that started before 8:30 that I basically missed? It's Kate. Okay. <laughs> How many presentations happened before? Yeah, I missed the memo that there were presentations happening before the session. Also, there's only yeah. one. There's only okay. One. Yeah. Okay. How many are there total? Um. Well, that's a good question. Uh, there should be about eight total. Oh, okay. Yeah. But what I, what I will do is uh, there'll be a list of uh, presentations for you to choose from. Okay, so it won't be one particular presentation, okay. and, and it will be uh, you know, presentations that are that, that are you know very good. Not to say that none of them will any of them will be bad. But I'm sure they'll all be amazing. But. Okay. We'll see. There was one tonight, and then there'll be three tomorrow. There should be the two The rest tomorrow. will be after. The rest will be after, yes. Okay. Okay. Yep. So any other questions on the exam itself? Because if not, then we have to turn to our presenters. I was just wondering approximately like how many pages the, the um, interview paper would be. It's not the presentations, but I was just wondering. Like, Yeah, so if you look in the uh, syllabus, there's, there's two parts of the interview paper, right? And I, I think the reflection is somewhere in the ballpark of uh, one to three in the interview, like two to five. Okay. But it's right there in the uh, syllabus is on the Moodle page. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think it's on page four. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. All right, and so no other questions for the final exam? Nope. All right, well, I'll be in my office tomorrow for our office hours. So if anything comes up, uh, feel free to uh, stop by and ask questions. So, if that's the case, then without further ado, uh, Stephanie, I believe you're up first. But just by a show yeah. of hands, who's presenting today? You got Stephanie today? Tara? Yep. I can't feel your hands. <laughs> can you hear me? Uh, Teresa? Yeah, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Hey, okay. Slow down a second. I am. I had emailed you, and I never Allie? put on the list, but. Okay. All right. Well, you know, we'll just jump in. So, uh, Stephanie, you're up first. Okay. Right. Are you able to hear me? I can. Perfectly. Okay. Um, so, I just shared my screen. I don't know if the you, PowerPoint's you, visible. You're yeah. ready to go. We can all see it. Okay. Perfect. Um, 
All right, so I chose the interview option and I chose to have a discussion with a friend of a friend. Her name is Erin Chapman and she works at the Erie County Medical Examiner's Office. So um, slightly different interpretation of, I guess, the type of people uh, who might be interviewed for this class um, because primarily she's not working with people leading up to death or even the grieving family members after she's dealing directly with the, the deceased, the recently deceased. Um, but I still thought she could provide some insights into, you know, a lot of the, you know, the rituals, the funeral rites, preparation uh, of the body before burial, um, and then give a regional perspective as well, um, since she works in Erie County at ECMC, uh, which is on the east side of Buffalo. Um, the thesis sort of developed after really sort of being surprised at the path that brought Aaron to work in this position at the Erie County Medical Examiner's Office and thinking about myself uh, being a PA student coming into this class and just some of the other people in this class and what, what brings us to take this um, and really, you know, how that connects to our career paths. Um, some of the thesis that I came up with is that there isn't really one type of person or professional path that is best suited to work with death or dying. Um, but instead, you have many different professions, whether they be religious, whether, whether they be medical, or whether they be scientific, um, who all have the same goal of, um, you know, showing respect to the recently deceased um, and also easing the suffering of the bereaved. Um, and, and again, to me, that was a surprise that, you know, outside of just people in like hospice care or, um, you know, working as a chaplain or something in a hospital, um, that there are other professions, you know, working with the recently deceased and the bereaved. Um, so just a quick background on Erin. So she's worked as a forensic anthropologist and public health consultant at ECMC since about 2012. She also works at UB in their comparative primate anatomy lab. And then before that was at Mercyhurst College. Um, her education up to this point has been primarily in anthropology forensic and biological, and then uh, pursuing a PhD there at UB. Whoops. Um, so the first, the first slide I have here, and uh, just a, an aside about my presentation, uh, obviously I had a lot of questions, more than I probably would have been able to just recite back to you uh, in this interview, but more so, you know, our, convert, our interview evolved more into just sort of a conversation. So I came up with sort of topics um, or major themes in our conversation and, and just kind of bullet, bulleted some points for each of those. Um, so Erin referred to her field, forensic anthropology, as anthropology's redheaded stepchild. Um, typically, you know, if any of you have had an interaction with an anthropology course, maybe it's something you took as like a social sciences requirement. Um, usually it's in the social sciences, not the sort of hard sciences like biology or chemistry. Uh, typically, anthropologists study bones and not soft tissue. So, you know, anthropologists are sort of working alongside archaeologists. They'll be the ones who, you know, find uh, bones, you know, recovering some sort of, in some sort of archaeological dig. And then they use their training of bones and sort of the, the developments and the differences to then identify, you know, the bones belong to whom or what civilization or what can we learn about them from it. Um, so typically, you know, anthropology, forensic anthropology was very much an academic field. Um, every once in a while, there would be a situation where a medical examiner's office, so somebody who's trying to identify the cause of a, you know, a recent death might look to a forensic anthropologist as a consultant. Um, you know, if you watch sort of uh, crime television shows, you know, you imagine the situation where somebody you know, comes upon bones buried in the yard somewhere, and then it'd be the anthropologist who they'd call in to, to look at the bones and say, who is this, what happened? Um, so it really been sort of a rare thing. Um, that all changed though after 9-11. Um, the New York City Medical Examiner's Office was the first to hire uh, a large number of forensic anthropologists and keep them on staff, really just to deal with the massive uh, recovery and identification effort that they had with all the victims from uh, the Twin Tower bombing. Um, 
most people, it should be noted, who you know typically would work in a medical examiner's office, um, they're pathologists. They're people who would have first pursued a degree, um, you know, an MD uh, degree, a medical degree, and then gone on and had additional training as a pathologist. So, um, you know, forensic anthropologists are new uh, to this field. Um, my questions, you know, sort of started with, you know, well, who goes to, um, you know, the medical examiner's office? Um, you know, if you've had a loved one, you know, pass away, and it, it's typically not something you deal with. It's not like the standard protocol. So I had some questions to her about sort of how to determine when somebody's, um, you know, case is sent to the medical examiner. Um, so every every county, every state sort of regulates this differently. A lot of smaller counties will have a coroner, which is like an elected official who issues documents, basically death certificates, the way that, you know, someone in um, like a county clerk's office might issue birth certificates. <clears throat> Excuse me, in Erie County um, and, and most of the surrounding counties, doctors or people in facilities can issue um, death certificates, but then they also have the option of uh, sending a case to the medical examiner's office. And so um, ECMC, the office that Aaron works at serves Erie and the, the surrounding counties. Basically what happens is if the police or a doctor or family member can pro provide what they call some sort of probable cause um, or basically probable cause for an investigation, there's some sort of reason um, to question or dispute or it's just completely unknown as to why someone has recently passed away, then that's when the case um, would be sent to them. So that's when the, the, the person's body would be sent to the Erie County Medical Examiner's Office uh, for an autopsy. Um, and then, you know, they would be the ones to issue the death certificate. Um, so sort of because of how things, you know, work out in the process, typically Aaron or somebody in the medical examiner's role or, you know, the role of a forensic anthropologist would not be dealing with the living. They're, they're only living with, the, or they're only, you know, dealing with the, with the deceased. Um, it would be police, um, the medical examiner's office has crime scene investigators, um, pathologists who would be the ones who, you know, would go out and maybe deal with collecting evidence um, and speaking with the family. Um, and I'll get into that um, a little bit later. Um, sorry, let me just flip through my notes here. Um, one of the things that I asked her about, um, you know, being again, in my professional uh, training here and taking a class like this, knowing that as a physician assistant, I'm going to be dealing with, you know, both possibly patients um, near end of life and their family members was saying, okay, so you're in this role now where you could be, you know, you're dealing with death on a daily basis. You could be seeing, especially if it's, you know, in a situation where, like I mentioned, it escalates to, um, you know, a body being sent for an autopsy, you could be seeing some pretty disturbing things. What, what sort of training did you have for this? You know, did you have any sort of classes about death and dying or, or classes that encourage more of this sort of, I don't know, spiritual end of, of looking into this? Um, and she didn't. And so then I started asking like, well, you know, what type of people go into this? Are they people who, you know, maybe have more of a religious sort of inclination or, um, you know, sort of have worked out some of those issues already about death and dying? And she said, you know, it, to her it seemed kind of split. There are definitely um, a large number of people who she would say are very religious. Um, and, you know, they have that as sort of a, a basis is, you know, something to help them deal with this aspect of their work. Um, however, what she sees more often is that people really rely on sort of their professional disposition to get them through this. So, you know, they, you know, it's it's a science that they're dealing with and they really, you know, try to view the job in, in those scientific terms as far as determining cause and effect for it um, and not trying to personalize the situation. Um, you know, one of the, the terms she uses avoiding a sort of a cognitive bias. Um, she used the example of seeing, you know, uh, children who come in and very often it's easy to, you know, kind of go into this protective role. You want to, um, you know, not see that anything bad happened to them. So a lot of people might assume you know, child abuse, um, if, if a, a situation where a child dies under mysterious circumstances, but sometimes sort of making those suppositions in their mind 
can provide a bias. And so it's best for them sort of not to personalize the situation, um, but just to think about sort of the evidence that's in front of them, the medical evidence, the anatomical evidence, um, and deal with it in that sense. Um, a rare exception to that um, that she mentioned was uh, in the case of the um, crash of the flight 3407, which happened in Clarence Center a few years ago. Um, because of the, the large number of, uh, you know, people who were deceased in that, they brought in a lot of other forensic anthropologists, uh, you know, they were staying in the area, um, and, you know, they were working a lot of hours. Their goal is always to, to get the um, autopsy procedure finished as soon as possible so they can release the bodies, you know, back to the families for, for burial or, or whatnot. Um, but what was difficult was that, you know, a lot of people lived in the area, um, could have had connections to the area, to the victim, victims, to their families. Uh, additionally, they said, you know, every night they'd come home and the news would be constantly running story, you know, profiling the victims, interviewing with their families. And that's what made it really uh, difficult for a lot of those people because, you know, again, they were sort of leaving uh, that professional realm, that scientific realm, and getting more involved into, you know, the personalities behind who are these people, uh, more so than just why did they end up here, but, you know, their life preceding that. Um, so, you know, when I started asking her specifically about, you know, people who might um, have religious uh, or other reasons to refuse an autopsy or might have specific restrictions or questions, um, she said that does not happen that often. Um, out of, she said, about the five to 6,000 uh, bodies that come to the medical officers, examiners a year for an autopsy, maybe once a month, they'll have a family refuse the autopsy. Um, I know most often this for religious re religious reasons, you know, sometimes explicitly the religion will say, you know, or forbid an autopsy. Sometimes it will be about, you know, those issues of, you know, not desecrating the body, like was mentioned in the review in reference to Judaism, you know, viewing it as sort of God's creation and not wanting to, to further destroy that, um, you know, but, and typically though, um, you know, the medical examiner's office, you know, without being pushy, do want to encourage families to get an autopsy, you know, if there could be medical evidence that could be shared with the family as to cause as to why someone passed away, um, you know, trying to encourage them that that could be helpful to know. Um, in New York State specifically, homicide cannot be prosecuted without evidence from an autopsy. So that would be something that if they wanted, you know, resolution to that situation, uh, they would need that specifically. Um, and to that end, the medical examiner's office really will try to balance the wishes of the family with the benefits of the autopsy. So, you know, if they can limit, um, you know, aspects of the autopsy, make it as minimally invasive um, as possible, and then by all means, you know, doing what they can to, you know, either have the autopsy performed within a certain time period or as quickly as possible or anything they can do to then further prepare the body, um, you know, for whatever rituals um, might be coming after that, they will certainly make those exceptions. Um, when I, I had asked Darren, you know, thinking about, you know, the population in the city of Buffalo and the way it's changed, you know, have you seen high incidence of, you know, maybe um, people of Muslim faith or different faiths coming in? And she said she really had them, but that the one example that she'd seen come up a couple of times were Native American. Um, so, you know, Western North has a large population of Haudenosaunee or, or Iroquois Indians. And similar to a lot of the different religions that uh, beliefs and practices that we discussed, um, the Native American, or I'm sorry, the Haudenosaunee belief is that um, the spirit uh, is something that will go on and live forever. And so there are very specific ceremonies that the chief uh, will lead the family through, you know, preparing the body, washing, dressing, um, going through different speeches um, in, in, a, in an attempt to, what they say, release the spirit from the duties of the earth so that it can move on into to what's called the sky world. So this includes a 10-day ceremony. All that takes place at home, you know, where all these, uh, these different rituals are being performed. From the view of a medical examiner, then that can be problematic. If, you know, a family or, you know, um, uh, or, you know, medical professionals then don't bring 
you know, a body in for an autopsy until 10 days has passed, that can provide, you know, obviously some problems for them and have some effect on, on um, what they're examining. So, you know, again, they try to be uh, as understanding as possible um, and really try to explain the families the benefits uh, and work with them to, to keep them uh, informed and meet their wishes as well. Um, so that brings me back to my conclusion, you know, sort of my thesis. There are many different paths that can lead someone to becoming a medical examiner or, you know, in a situation where they're dealing with uh, the recently deceased or the grief professionals. And I, I find it interesting and a little disheartening that, um, you know, despite this work of, you know, the professionals to uh, try to prepare themselves to, you know, help these families, there's not a ton of preparation for the professionals themselves, you know, to deal with their own struggles through this, or maybe to be more prepared to deal with, um, you know, individuals with different beliefs and different religions. Um, you know, obviously that'd be something that'd be good to see an increase in, but it seems that that, you know, that professional disposition, that scientific disposition is what uh, ultimately helps them uh, get through that. Awesome, Stephanie, thank you so much. Unfortunately, you're not going to have time for, for questions, but that, that was an awesome presentation. Great job. So let's go to our next uh, presenter, which is uh, Teresa. Teresa, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Um, okay. Is your your camera working? I oh, got it. Oh, good, 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 perfect. Okay. So, so, so there's a button called uh, Share Your Screen. So open up your PowerPoint and share your screen. And for those of you that are, are presenting, please have your PowerPoints open on your desktop. And you see the share your screen button? Yeah. There you go. I we got it. Okay. We're golden. All right. Okay. Um, if you could just go to the slideshow and start the slideshow. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So um, I decided to present about the stages of grief and coping with death. Um, I chose this topic because I personally have never lost a loved one. Um, so I don't really know what it's like to feel how it is, you know, to go through those stages of grief and everything. And also I work as an LPN in a nursing home. So I do see, um, you know, there are a lot of deaths, but I'm not involved in the grieving process as much. I'm just mostly, you know, there to make sure they're comfortable and, you know, give medications and such. So I thought this was a good topic. For me. So um, I focus on, on hospice care, um, and I included in the slide just some things from our Prezi presentation from class um, that talked about um, hospice. Just to give you guys a reminder, because um, I'm going to be talking a lot about hospice um, and their main goals and philosophies. Um, and a really good point from our um, presentations from class was, um, I really like the quote uh, we said, at the center of hospice is the belief that we have the right to die pain-free and with dignity, and that our families will receive the necessary support to allow us to do so. Um, and that's important too, because um, the families are sometimes forgotten in the grieving process. Um, and just two other things from the um, Prezi, presentation was just hospice focuses on caring and not caring, and hospice offers care to the patient and family unit, as I uh, previously stated. Um, so I interviewed a hospice nurse, so I just wanted to go in a little bit just to explain the hospice nurse's role. Um, hospice, just beginning hospice is a holistic care. Um, the hospice nurses visit patients on a regular basis, assess them for comfort, grief, and their disease progression. And they also work with spiritual care chaplains, uh, bereavement specialists, music therapists, volunteer coordinators, home health aides, nurse practitioners, nurse educators, hospice MDs. And also, I didn't even add in there LPNs. Um, many times while we're you know, working, the hospice nurse will come and they'll ask meet myself or the CNA, the nursing assistant, how the patient is doing because we see them more often and we can see those changes, you know, better than them when they're just, you know, they're here and they have a lot of patients and they're just moving around. So um, 
<laughs> that was one point I actually didn't forgot to put in there, but we are um, involved in that. Um, so I interviewed a registered nurse. Her name is Jennifer Hennigan. Um, she has worked with me for the past two years, and um, I was actually really surprised um, when I interviewed her to find out that she has only been a nurse for two years because she is a really excellent hospice nurse. Um, she comes in, she sees her patients. She's very thorough, she follows up, and she just has like a calm and caring demeanor. Um, just something, she, she, she went back to school to become a nurse. She was a, a stay-at-home mom since 1994, and um, she just had that caring and compassion in her, and it was just awesome that she found what she loved right away as soon as she decided to go back to school. <laughs> um, but um, I asked her a few questions about grief, and um, when I interviewed her, um, she kind of confirmed my thesis, which I'll um, talk about on the next slide. Um, I asked her, uh, how do you help families in their grieving process and the stages of grief? So um, so through her, with her interview, um, it came confirmation of what we learned in class, um, that every culture and family handles death very differently. No two experiences are alike and must be treated as such. And um, it is confirmed that everyone goes through the stages of grief and they do not always occur in the same order. So just like a little review too about the stages of grief was with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. It was the very beginning of the semester. So I thought I'd just put um, just a little reminder of what they are. Uh, denial is the first, usually the defense mechanism. Um, anger usually comes against the family or staff or just everyone because, you know, they're dying and they, you know, they're starting to accept it and they become angry. Um, the next is bargaining, you know, like bargaining with God or whomever you believe in, you know, maybe if I do this, I'll get better. Um, depression, which is um, something that I personally at work see very often um, when people are starting to accept it and they're starting to shut people out. Their families are coming in and their families are feeling the depression and it, it's just it's a very very difficult stage for both the patients and the families and um, the last is acceptance is when coming to terms with death um, accepting it and at peace with it okay so um, the stages of grief from a hospice nurse's perspective um, Based on uh, her response, everyone she's taken care of has experienced at least one or two of the stages of grief before death. Um, she does work with patients um, very close to end of life most of the time, so she doesn't usually see all of the um, phases. And also in a nursing home, many of the patients have dementia or different comorbidities to the, which would um, limit them from showing all of their emotions. Um, but she does see the, has seen the stages um, in some in them and also their family member. Um, I put this quote in that she said from her interview as, as a response because I thought it was good. Um, she says, the biggest part of supporting families during the grieving process is allowing the patients and families lead the way during their experience. One thing I have learned is that no two deaths or patients are the same. Each family goes through the experience of losing a loved one in their own way, and even though we have our own ideas on how they cope through it, it is one of the most personal and individual experiences one can go through. In my experience, each patient and family member does go through at least some of the stages of grief and much support is needed. And I really, really liked how she put that when she said, no matter how our own ideas are, because still we must remember even, even what we learn in class, you know, we learn all these things you know, we expect to apply it, but every person is different and, you know, we, we, we just need to be prepared and understand grief and then help the um, patients and family members go through it that way. Um, and then at the bottom, not only does the patient experience the stage of grief, but the family also experiences them. Um, uh, just some more from her interview, um, according to her, the patient, it's well, as I previously stated, goes through either experience of death in their own way. 
Um, it is her job to help the patient and family through the stages of grief. And um, I thought I'd put this in there because we, we just recently talked about Judaism. Um, she's mainly assigned to the Jewish home, so it is up to her. Um, I'm sorry, that's where we work at the Jewish home of Rochester. We live in Rochester, so um, it is up to her and the staff um, to ensure that the Jewish rituals are followed after death appropriately. Um, now, because it's a Jewish nursing home, um, there are many um, Jewish residents, but there are many who are not. So this is not always something that needs to be followed. And, um, you know, we do uh, celebrate all the Jewish holiday Passover. Everything is kept kosher. That is very strict, but um, you don't, you do not have to be Jewish to um, live there. And I was fortunate enough to, I wanted to show you guys um, a shroud kit. Um, I, it's in the packaging, but I thought Very it was, cool. yeah, um, it has the step-by-step -step instructions of exactly how to shroud the patient, and um, I thought it was really good to show you guys this, and this is something that I've actually been able to um, help with. Now, um, in the review, we were talking about the Orthodox Jewish um, customs and, you know, with the female caregivers and stuff. I've taken care of a few um, residents who were very strict Orthodox, but because of their state, their family sort of understood that they allowed um, us female caregivers to give them care and wash, you know, wash their family member. Um, but they did stay in the room. You know, um, one of the beliefs is not that the, they, the dying they should not be alone, so they would like face turn around and face the corner or something like that. But um, it's when it comes to you know nursing home care. You know, they kind of, they're a little lenient, but we have, this is something that um, I'm a part of, and not all of them choose to be, you know, with the shroud, but mostly every Jewish patient, you know, we have to, we open the window, we let the spirit out, we close anything that has reflection, all of those, um, we have to follow those practices. So I thought that was just something I just add in there because that's where um, myself and the hospice nurse that I work with, we work there, so. That a lot. <clears throat> okay. Um, also, I just wanted to talk about helping the family through the dying process. Um, as um, Jennifer, my interviewee, said that, that helping the families is some of the biggest, um, biggest part of her job because, um, again, like I stated, the patient may have dementia or something, and it's normally in our field, it's, it's harder for the family than it is for the patient. Um, so it's just um, something that I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't know until she told me that the hospice nurse provides the families with community resources before and after the loved one passes away. Um, they're available to help them cope with grief even years after um, their loved one has passed away. So um, I thought that was great that they have different resources because as we talked about those stages of grief, there's no timetable for them. So even years later, someone could still be in anger, or, you know, and it's awesome that they have these services. Um, and I also added here another quote from Jen, which I thought was really awesome. Um, she says, um, there isn't a work day that goes by that one of them doesn't make me smile. As I continue to learn about ways to manage symptoms at the end of life, my goal is to be the patient's advocate on a daily basis to make their end of life experience however long or short, peaceful and comfortable. I also enjoy making these moments during the day when I see my patients special in some way, whether through a smile, quiet word, or gentle touch. Wow, that was awesome, she's awesome. <laughs> okay, so in conclusion, um, just to reiterate my thesis, um, each, um, that each uh, patient and family must be assisted through uh, the dying process based on their needs. Um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was indeed correct, I believe so, when she described the stages of grief and how each person um, experienced them differently and uh, for different amounts of time. And uh, each person will experience at least some of the stages of grief when um, coping with the loss of a loved one or experiencing the dying process themselves. And um, I just thought this was a really good topic for myself in the class because I'm um, sorry, if you're going in the healthcare field, because that is imminent for all of us, and it's something that we should all be familiar with, the stages, and we never know when we might experience a loss or need help ourselves, so I thought this was an awesome topic. Great job. Yeah. And, 
Hey, you think there's any way you can get me at one of those shrouds? <laughs> yeah, we have a lot. I'm oh, serious. Yeah. I, I, I really want one. Okay, I can I can give you this one. They let me have this one. Awesome. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, great presentation. So, Tara, you're up next. Tara? Okay, yep. Um, so, the share screen button I'm looking for right now. You're sharing your screen right now. You just did. Okay. Or you were. <laughs> All right. Oh, never mind. That wasn't you. Uh, no, that was me. Okay. So you're not sharing your screen anymore. There's a share screen button. You might be say quick start. Um. Oh, okay. Quick start. Deal. Yes. That I've yes. got. Got it. All right. And you'll see it in the bottom, right in the middle. Arrow. Oh. Pointing out. Is it? Um. Just share screen. I hit it, and it's. Let's see. Is it happy oh, now? You're good. You're good. You're good. Okay, it's happy. Awesome. Um, it also kicked my PowerPoint back out of the. View. You're good. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. Cool. Yeah. Can you just? So. Okay. Yeah, I kicked it back out of the full screen view for some reason. So we're getting back there. All right. You were. Right. Oh. Don't forget the the ten minutes, Tara. Okay. All right. I've I've narrowed it down a lot. So yeah, here we go. I'll start my timer. All right. So music thanatology and it is subtitled Notes for the Core of Death because music thanatology has great ways to address cores, uh, cores beliefs. So as we go into that, um, I was introduced to music thanatology through the hospital presence of music thanatologists where I worked, and also there was a music thanatology training program where I lived in Eugene. So what is music thanatology? Well, we will start with the music portion of it. So I would like to ask, when is music in your life? So what music do you listen to when you feel sad or angry or happy? Has music ever brought you to tears or had you laughing? And what music do you listen to when you're cleaning your house? or working out, or driving, or dancing, right? You know, music brings us to dancing. So with those in mind, uh, would you agree that music influences how you feel? Well, that brings us to the thanatology piece. And for that, let me introduce you to Laura Moya. So she is a music thanatologist, and she came to music thanatology by sort of a circuitous route. It began with her reading the book Music and Miracles by Don Campbell, and that introduced music thanatology to her. Uh, within six months, she had moved herself and her children from Colorado to Montana and started training in music thanatology. Through that training, she was certified in 1997 and has been at her full-time music thanatology position for 15 years now in Portland. Um, sorry. Stray cat had kittens in my office last month. They're kind of, yeah, they make a little bit of noise right now. Um, and besides her full-time position at the Providence Hospital in Portland, she also has been teaching for 10 years now. So with music thanatology teaching and practicing, what is music thanatology? What are these music thanatologists doing? Well, Laura has what she calls an elevator talk. An elevator talk is usually a figure of speech, but for her, it can literally be, we have somebody in the elevator with me going up three floors in the hospital while I have a harp in the elevator at the hospital. Um, so people are very inquisitive in those moments. And when she's in, in that situation, she says that this is a very new emerging field using qualities and elements of music in supportive palliative care. So. To, to perform music thanatology, the music thanatologist holds a music vigil. And in that setting, the vigil means a period of watchful attention. And a music thanatologist uses what's called prescriptive harp for patients and their families. So this can be done when a patient is actively dying or in sessions that last for about a half an hour within six months of their hospice plan suspected death date. Call it. Um, so, in, in essence, these are people playing harp for those who are in the process of dying. 
So music Thanatology was pioneered in this form by Therese Schroeder Schecker. And there she is right there, her with her harp. Uh, this is considered a new field in this form. It's depending on how you're measuring it, it's about 20 to 30 years old in this particular development. It's currently regulated by the Music Thanatology Association International. And that certification has been around for only about 12 years currently. So the use of harp is only the only instrument that's recognized by this association, by MTAI. And through history, civilizations such as the Greeks, Chinese, or Egyptians have recognized music for what they call its full circle properties. So this was used for healing um, and for all different stages of, of healthcare, um, including using music for death historically. So this is sort of another you know, incarnation of, of music thanatology that's happening currently. So music thanatology is different from music therapy, which is a clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions to accomplish individual goals. So basically music therapy has more school, broader base of treatment, and is not just HARP. Uh, so with using the HARP for music thanatology, why, you know, why is that the chosen instrument? Well, it isn't just harp, it's specifically the folk harp. So the folk harp is smaller and has less complication um, and is also practically fits in the rooms, which is an important thing. The folk harp plays melodies that are simple and can also have simple accompaniments, has a good range, it's greater than the piano, and 26 to 34 strings, depending on the harp. The strings that are used for music thanatology are nylon or either, or either nylon wrapped strings, and that produces a softness of the sound. So that's for the quality of the music that's being played. The harp instrument is also valued in music thanatology because it has no intermediary. So it's conveying the direct human touch and amplifying that as sound. Also, the harp can get very low tones. And Laura talked about when people are in pain, sometimes excruciating pain while dying, that their senses will be greatly heightened. And so even sometimes the lowest tones she can get are very painful for people. Um, but the harp offers a, a broader range to accommodate that pain. The long strings on harps have less tension as well. So that has a greater soothing resonance that they can produce in the room. Uh, Laura mentioned that she did not want to impose a lot of vibration on an ill or dying person, that that it can be painful or distracting. and these are all various elements of why the folk harp is the uh, exclusively used instrument for the certification in music thanatology currently. Uh, but she did mention that with the evolution of the field, you could see changes in that perhaps. And even though music thanatologists go through less school than a music therapist, that is not to say that their training is not involved. This is a, a list that is not um, an exhaustive list even, but some of the things that I thought were more interesting within the training program. Specifically, I would point out the third one down it's called Anthroposophy. And Anthroposophy was established by Rudolf Steiner, so yes, the Waldorf guy. And this has a, a variety of different standpoints and, um, and beliefs within Anthroposophy, but one of the most interesting ones that applies to music thanatology is a recognition of not a five cent system, but a 12 cent system. And through recognizing and studying these 12 senses, that's part of the training that allows music thanatologists to be it's called radically perceptive and then respond with music. So by picking up on the subtle nuances that are happening in all these 12 directions of senses, that allows them to address each of the, these subtle realities. Uh, so in fact, some descriptive terms that Laura feels are very important to her work include responsive music, making order out of chaos. Um, the next two she emphatically emphasized over and over in her quotations, incredibly dynamic and radically responsive. And because of this responsiveness, that's why a recording would not do for this format at all, because they are moment to moment being present with what's going on and then adjusting to help facilitate that. So with the palliative tendencies, those types of cares, it's not a goal-oriented uh, care per se. So they're part of the medical team. Uh, they work with all of the other caretakers that are either in the hospice, you know, hospital setting, home setting, either way. 
and the, the goal is not to bring the person back to wellness. You know, music thanatology is for dying people. But they offer support for what's needed in the moment. They're supremely present and have to stay very, very present in the experience that they're having with that patient at that time. And because of this and the regular sessions that one might have in their hospice process, that connection that the music thanatologist has with the patient leads to valuable medical observations. So the quality and the content of the time that the music thanatologist spends leads them to picking up on things like depression, oftentimes before the MD or nurse might. So as we're going through this talk, as she and I, we, we talked multiple times about these interviews, and throughout our conversation, I kept hearing CORE's tasks, which was one of my, my questions, what I was hoping to frame this within. Uh, I kept hearing her address these without specifically saying CORE's tasks. So I asked her explicitly about Kubler-Ross and CORE, and she'd heard of Ross, but was actually not familiar with CORE. So that was a really neat opportunity for us to discuss CORE, and we discussed the importance of physical, you know, psychological, social, and spiritual all being addressed in death, and then also the benefits of framing as tasks. So that led to an entire discussion. I emailed her some information, um, then we wrapped up that session, and after she had reviewed that, we resumed and we rehashed our previous conversation all within the framing of CORE's tasks and how relevant that is and how, you know, something that she was addressing without framing it in, in, in core. And then we ended up going off after that and, and finding all of these other ways and kind of making these neat aha connections. So that was a, a fun validation of seeing core in practical application. Then after, you know, after that discussion, one of the things she said specifically about core is, as I filter what I observe, I try to put as little bias on the observation as possible to try to be aware of letting things be as they are. Uh, she also mentioned her practice changing over the years. So when someone is navigating through core tasks, it's truly challenging. Dying is hard work and requires letting go of so much. Uh, it was one of the things she also said was good about the harp is that she can play simple sounds and sometimes having more complicated music distracts a person instead of facilitating their process. Uh, she also mentioned that offering the best supportive care through the music as possible. Uh, in the beginning, she felt like if I were good enough, they would all open up to this cathartic experience. And she really felt that her music was, was supposed to be kind of like a, a magic cure-all. Uh, but she said, now I know to meet them where they are and accept that I am facilitating their genuine experience, which I thought was really beautiful. And I asked about her spirituality. We were running short on time, so uh, she said that she finds religion to be too limiting in life and death, although she had a Roman Catholic upbringing, but she does appreciate those who subscribe to faith traditions. And it found it interesting to get have an opportunity to interface with many of those practices during death. And I asked about her spiritual beliefs, and she said that the spiritual world feels much more real to me through this work. After witnessing hundreds of deaths, some of them extraordinary in peace, beauty, and courage of the patient, I feel the deep connection of life and death and of its awesome mystery. I'm not a religious person, but feel that this, this work has put me in daily connection with grace and with love. And she said specifically the divine. And I asked for her advice, having this audience of you know, future healthcare professionals and uh, you know, also people just going off into the world after hearing about music thanatology. And she says she'd like to pass on a shout out for a book called The Grace in Dying by Kathleen Singh, an incredible book that takes a wonderful perspective on living and dying from a spiritual and psychological framing. I recognize myself and many of my patients that I've played for in these pages. Some of the things I've learned are, death can be beautiful, become as familiar as you can with your own death. It is the only way to not be afraid of it. Love sometimes means allowing someone to die, but being fully present to someone and being able to be so quiet as to truly listen to them is a tremendous gift, both to the speaker and the listener. And this brought me, final, I'm wrapping up, I promise, um, to music thanatology is often referred to something that can address the, the challenges of dying and core tasks when words don't fit. So it can help bring a person to peace with some of their personal tasks, some of the social tasks, some of that awkward reality of being in the room with a dying family member or a dying friend. And, you know, what do I say now? What do I do? I want to just be. And it reminded me of I have a good friend, Leah Jameson. She's a wonderful musician, beautiful musician. And her grandfather died last year, and she naturally played music for him. She didn't know anything about music thanatology. But she played music for him and actually shared with me a half-hour recording that she has of it. Obviously, 
uh, we can't listen to right now, but it was her naturally being drawn to addressing core's tasks through music without realizing that they were core's tasks and that music was a way to do this. So it reminded me of, you know, through the eons that this has been a practice and it's been continuously discovered and rediscovered because it's a natural fit to what's happening during death. And I feel like that's really beautiful and relevant. So great. Thank you. That's good job. Yeah, that's what I got. Oh, that's a pretty cool power PowerPoint uh, background. Uh, Monita, you're up. Thanks, I made it. Well, Monita, Monita, do you guys hear me? Oh. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I can hear you. Uh, uh, Monita. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. You ready? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So I'm sorry, I start... emailed you that I was going to like paper. for. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Yeah. All right, sorry. This is a lot of email. That's, still that's here. fine. Okay, Amy. Amy, are you still presenting? Oh, I'm still here. Amy. I'm ready to present. Okay, you're up. So go to Quick Start, and then you'll see that share screen. There you go. You got it. Okay. So is it, is it, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. No, sorry. Start. <laughs> I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about. Um, deactivating cardiac devices, specifically in end-of-life care, uh, caring for patients. And from the perspective of a future healthcare provider, I think we can all kind of look at this perspective clinically. Um, so first I want to describe that a pacemaker is a small battery-operated device that's surgically implanted in patients with abnormally slow heart rates or bradycardia. This functions by sending low energy impulses to the SA node to set the pace of the heart. A person is a candidate for a pacemaker if they have symptoms of severe heart failure. We also have ICDs, which are implantable cardioverter defibrillators, and they are also a small battery powered device. It's implanted under the skin, just below the collarbone. This monitors the heart rate and delivers an electrical shock to restore normal heartbeat if the heart rate increases or an arrhythmia is detected. If someone has survived a cardiac arrest, ventricle tachycardia, or a life-threatening arrhythmia, their cardiologist will suggest implanting an ICD. Now, most ICDs can function as pacemakers, and by regulating, by regulating the heartbeat, if a life-threatening arrhythmia is detected. So as future healthcare providers, we will care for many patients with ICDs, and pacemakers. We may even be faced with the controversial issue of turning off these devices in actively dying patients. Now, typically, when one of these devices is implanted, a conversation doesn't happen at the time of implantation about the possibility of deactivating it later down the road. Uh, as part of a healthcare team, it's important to understand the differences between the two devices and the moral and legal standings of deactivating each device. So most cardiologists are actually less comfortable with pacemaker deactivation because many patients are dependent on the pacemaker uh, as compared to the dependency of ICDs in patients. Uh, pacemakers are continuously functioning, so deactivating a pacemaker in some patients may be as, as lethal as pulling the plug on ventilation. So this is a decision that should be carefully considered by the patient, the family, and the physician. Now, after a conversation regarding diagnosis, prognosis, and goals, a MOLT form is filled out by the physician. This is a legal form used by healthcare facilities in New York State to honor patients' decisions and preferences regarding end-of-life care. This is intended for patients with serious health conditions who may be residing in long-term care facilities, those who might die within a year, and those who want to avoid or receive life-sustaining treatment. Now, this form should include instructions on cardiac devices, but that's not always the case. And in my research, I found that out of 414 hospice facilities that were surveyed, only 10% of them had a policy addressing deactivation. So 
as a future healthcare provider and possibly having to make this decision one day, I want to think about this from a, a clinical standpoint. I want to present a hypothetical patient, Claire, who had a heart attack at age 65 and she underwent ICD implantation. Now, 10 years later, she's diagnosed with colon cancer and she's failed chemotherapy. So she's now a candidate for hospice care, which means her health care goals have changed. She feels as though she's lived a good long life. She's accepted her prognosis. So upon entering hospice, she and her family are faced with the decision of deactivating her ICD, and we must have this conversation with her. So as her physician, if we intervene and turn off her ICD per her request, are we withdrawing her life-sustaining support? This is typically a common practice in end-of-life care with patients who have defibrillators like Claire. Now, in fact, uh, 336 medical professionals that were surveyed, 98% of them support deactivating an ICD when it's requested by a terminally ill patient. So then I bring up the question of whether or not deactivating the ICD is considered the same as stopping another life-sustaining therapy such as dialysis or chemotherapy. All three of them in some patients can be life-sustaining, um, but sometimes they're viewed differently. In this case, the ICD is causing her discomfort when the goal of her hospice care is to be comfortable. So if we do not intervene, and if we keep the ICD on, she may experience uncomfortable shock from her defibrillator. Now this will feel like an alarming kick in her chest, and it may cause a jolt of her body while she's resting. This may even be quite disturbing to her and her family. It could increase her anxiety as she anticipates another electrical shock. So she's no longer comfortable, which is not the goal of her hospice care. So is her ICD now considered a burdensome treatment? It's a very important question to think of. Um, but deactivating these ICDs have become relatively non-controversial. So it does require a request from the patient and also a physician order. It can be done non-surgically, and the process is actually simple and painless. I want to talk about a more controversial issue, so I'll bring up Ralph. He had a pacemaker implanted about five years ago after experiencing bradycardia. He was recently diagnosed with brain tumor. He is not a candidate for surgery. He declined radiation, so he's now under hospice care in his own home. His daughter is greatly involved in his care, and she feels as though her father's pacemaker is prolonging his life against his wishes. Um, she requests, along with Ralph, that her pacemaker, his pacemaker be deactivated. Um, now, as his health care provider, we know that Ralph's heart is dependent on his pacemaker, which is set to beat 60 times per minute. So by deactivating his pacer, we know he will not survive. I bring up the question of whether or not this is passive euthanasia. 19% of physicians view deactivating a pacemaker in pacemaker-dependent patients like Ralph to be physician-assisted suicide. However, I do want to clarify that deactivating a pacemaker is very different from administering a medication that would cause death as done in physician-assisted suicide. So therefore, the debate is not whether deactivating a pacemaker is considered physician-assisted suicide, but rather the idea that withdrawing the support is causing death. Um, after extensive reading, I did find that a lot of people will consider, consider that death after withdrawal of support is actually attributed to the patient's underlying pathology, and it is not a form of physician-assisted suicide. So therefore, grant, granting a terminally ill patient's wish to withdraw unwanted medical support is legal and ethical. But at this stage, is Ralph's pacemaker considered extraordinary means because his condition is not improving? Well, he and his daughter feel so, but you as a physician need to consider your intention. You intervene and turn off his pacer, you are intending to end his burdensome suffering. If you do not intervene and keep Ralph's pacemaker on, his body will eventually succumb to his illness, the battery in the pacer will eventually die. But I will remind you that when he dies, technically he will still have a heartbeat until the battery dies in his pacer. Um, but turning it off 
you are granting his wishes to withdraw his life-sustaining treatment, which he has the right to, but you may be possibly violating your ethics knowing his heart will stop beating shortly after. To turn off the pacemaker is a painless process. It's deemed legal by the Heart Rhythm Society, and if this procedure is requested by a patient but goes against the physician's morals, they can be referred to another physician to do the process, the procedure. So deactivating a cardiac device is legal if it's requested by the patient or their surrogate. The pacemaker deactivation process remains less common than ICD deactivation. Many healthcare providers will support ICD deactivation when a terminally ill patient requests it. However, the more complicated dilemma remains the deactivation of pacemakers. As the healthcare provider, your morality is relative to each individual situation and requires careful consideration and intention. These questions are difficult to answer, but need to be brought to the attention of healthcare providers who may be faced with such controversial issues during end of life care. Great job, Amy, thank you. Exactly. These presentations are awesome. It's like the good work, guys, or ladies. Um, so are do, you, do we have time for a quick question on that? Um, as, it's, really it's really hot. As Katie, Katie, are you, you're up next. Are you, are you still presenting, Katie? I'm still presenting, yep. Awesome. So why don't you get ready, and then Carrie, yes, okay. you can answer questions. So I just have a quick question. So I actually have a peacemaker right here. I just realized I have one by my desk. And it's not in your heart, though. <laughs> no, no, right here. Here we go. Um, so it, I, I think it's really interesting because the reps oftentimes control those pacemakers remotely and are the ones who calibrate them. Um, that'll be like back and forth through the, the doctor's offices. I hadn't thought about the, the legal ramifications of uh, like St. Jude or some company getting the, you know, doing the deactivation with or without a doctor. Companies order. can't turn them off like that. No. I work in an ER, they cannot. You can interpret the pacemakers, but you cannot turn them off electronically. Thank you. St. Jude can, inter, um, can turn them down all the way to being completely awesome. It's like that's what they trained us when I was doing cardiac surgery, when they would calibrate them when we were doing putting the pacemakers in. Um, yeah, when they were hooked up, they said they could do it remotely. But, yeah. Then, uh, like we, we I, I got to cut this conversation short, okay. but I wonder if it has to do with the state. I, I wonder what's, what might be illegal here is will be legal in part of in, in Oregon, I wonder if this is sort of the, the sanctions. Um, but I don't know, I get it. Another great question, awesome, awesome, very good. Uh, so, Katie. All right, I chose to do my presentation on voodoo. Um, my thesis statement is. Well, hold on, you have all this experience as a nurse and, and you chose to do voodoo? I had um, some dark times. I had three pediatric codes in one week. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, like, I was going to do an interview, <laughs> but that guy, I, I couldn't face him for a while. So, I chose to do a different religion. Well, than my would own. you mind doing your, your slideshow uh, as a full screen? Is it screen? on? Full screen? Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Perfect. All right. Voodoo. My thesis statement is Voodoo is a monotheistic religion of Haitian origin. According to Voodoo practitioners, all things that exist are composed of spirit. Ritualistic behaviors honoring both the souls of lost family members and a multitude of spirits and lesser gods are a hallmark of this religion. This presentation will discuss voodoo, its background, and common death and bereavement ritual practices. Voodoo is a creolized religion forged by descendants of the Dohomeen, Congo, Yoruba, and other African ethnic groups that had been enslaved. The word voodoo means spirit or deity in the Fon language of the African kingdom of Dahomey. Voodoo is the official religion of Haiti. The fundamental principle of voodoo is that everything is spirit. The religion of voodoo is a monotheistic religion in which there are certain classes of spirits and lesser gods all subservient of the one true God. So when I'm saying, um, with the slave trade, all these African slaves were brought to Haiti before they went to the New World. So voodoo is actually from Africa, but became the true Haiti religion because of the slave trade. Goal is to serve the spirits, the Iowa, they believe the Christian God is the creator of the world. There's no heaven or hell, however. The belief is that spirits live on a land called Ginnon. Rituals are performed to return for health, protection, and favors. During these rituals, believers enter a trance-like state and perform medical miracles and physical tasks that would be considered impossible. So our, the family members that we are performing the rituals to, they are the ones that actually perform the miracles instead of God. 
but they do believe in the same God as Christianity does. They actually do believe in the Old Testament, but not the New Testament. Some common terms in voodoo is the ayahuasca, the spirits, the misty, the mysteries, the ends of it is the invisibles, zanj, the angels, and afu is a voodoo temple, Hugan is a priest, mambo is a priestess, and gobi is a clay jar, which we will discuss more later. Some rituals are the rada, which is used in the initiation rite and involves the god Los, who have come from Africa and who represent the lost mystic world. Petro involves bad Los. The word Petro inescapably conjures up visions of implacable force, of roughness, and even ferocity. And then there's rituals nine night and rite of reclamation are um, funeral process rituals, actual, that we will be discussing. Followers of voodoo believe that each person has a soul and that it contains both the part of the person and a part of the larger universe. People who practice voodoo believe the soul of the deceased is believed to linger for about a week after the physical death. And in that time, a priest or priestess will perform a ritual to release the soul from the body, allowing the soul to remain in dark water for the next 366 days. During this time, the soul can be captured and used by an evil one and made into a zombie to be enslaved to serve the one who made him. So if the rituals aren't performed, they believe the soul and the body are connected for one week. If the rituals are not performed, they believe an evil spirit can actually take your family member's soul and enslave them and actually make them perform evils against humanity. So it's very important for the rituals to be followed. As stated in the previous slide, the soul can stay in the body for a week. Therefore, a ritual needs to be done to release the soul before the soul becomes evil. The ritual is called nine nights. The nine night is performed in order to completely release the soul from the body so the soul may live in the dark waters for a period of a year and a day. If this is not properly done, the soul may wander the earth and do harm to others. After 366 days, another ritual is completed. This is where the soul is called into a clay jar where the spirit of the family member will be seen as a tool for guidance and life lessons for the family. So basically the nine night ritual is your soul has been in the dark waters for 366 days. They are calling back the soul and placing the soul into this clay jar. And they might put these in graves in crematoriums or in um, ritual like um, mantles in family homes. And they will pray for miracles, kind of like Christians would pray for St. Anthony to help them with stuff. Um, the ritual is called rite of reclamation. The clay jar may be placed in a temple or on an altar where the family may come and offer gifts and feed it, offer a drink, and pay homage to it. So voodoo is kind of like the ancient Egyptian religion, how we would feed the mummy for favors. They believe that if you feed the clay jar that your family member is in, your favors and your miracles can be created. Since the family, this is how they treat their dying. Since family and honoring the dead is important in voodoo, the dying patient is treated very well by the family. When death is certain, the family will come together and bring with them religious artifacts. I'm sorry, we close that. It's okay in this religion to show emotion in front of the dying. The family will cry and pray. The preferred way to die is to die at home surrounded by loved ones. For people that practice voodoo, hospice is a very good option. They do prefer their loved ones to be at home surrounded by these religious artifacts and with the family around the home praying and mourning for their death, um, treating the dying. At the time of death, the family does not need to be stoic in order for the soul to find their way in other religions like Buddhism. I thought this was very interesting because the body is still, the body and soul is together for a week. The family can show emotions. The spirit won't become evil if and want the will to stay, kind of like in the other religions we have learned. At the time, there is a ritual wailing and a final bath is given. Um, so the family members are crying and the bath is given kind of like in Islam to purify the body for the rituals. At this time, the eldest family will start to arrange the funeral. Funerals are extremely significant social events and last for several days in which rum is consumed and large amounts of food. During this time, the family will sleep in the house and friends stay in the yard. Um, this kind of reminded me of Egyptian again, how you would have parties and mourners would come and mourn for someone who they might not have even known. A side note is that since the body must be intact for resurrection at the end of the days, no organ donations are permitted. They also don't permit um, autopsies as well. The funeral practices differ based on the economic status of the deceased and the family member. If the family of the deceased is wealthy, they will usually own a crypt, and depending on how important they would like the deceased to seem to the community, they may even pay mourners to attend the services. 
where poor families may have a tougher choice and may not be able to respect the deceased. Families have to rent a space for their loved ones to rest. If a family cannot afford to properly bury a loved one, they may abandon the body, making it impossible to properly honor that person. This is a huge issue in Haiti right now. Um, you can actually find a lot of research articles about the grave diggers. There's not even enough room in Haiti because it's such a small island for all these bodies to be buried in. Um, so grave diggers are actually unburying other bodies and putting new bodies and charging these families for that plot. Another issue is all the hurricanes are actually bringing up the bodies um, so they're not, they're kind of being disrespected by nature. Um, honoring the dead. It is important in voodoo to celebrate the deceased because, as mentioned earlier, the deceased can help heal the sick and grant favors for the living. Thus, voodoo believers have a holiday called Ancestry Day that is celebrated on January 2nd. This is a holiday reserved to give thanks to ancestors and other loved ones who have died for freedom, as well as those who have passed on during the last year. They believe their future depends on the ways they honor their ancestors. There's also a lot of research that voodoo is the religion that um, helped Haiti become slave free. They believe that when they were praying to the ancestors who were mostly slaves, they did not want the slavery to happen and that voodoo is the reason why slavery has ended. And then this is just two, two videos. I know one of them is way too long. It's 20 minutes. The other one is a minute and a half. I don't know how I've been doing with time and I know we're crunched for time. So. Yeah, we're, we're pretty tight today. So, yep, uh, so unfortunately, can't watch the That's fine. Yep. Just um, in conclusion, voodoo is a monotheistic religion. It relies on honoring the spirits of the dead as rituals that must be done in order for the family to reach a good death and not become an evil soul. Voodoo is an orthopraxy religion. And those are my references. Good. Very good. Thank you. Okay, so our next uh, presenter is Allie. Are you still presenting, Allie? Yes. Okay, you're up. Okay, so I did an interview with the funeral director, and his name was Michael Rooney. He is a local funeral director with three homes in the area. So a little history, he, or the funeral homes were founded by Vincent Rooney, which is his father in 1938, and Vincent had three sons, James, Paul, and Michael. So the original home is in Niagara Falls, which was actually their family home for a while. And it was actually the first building in Iron Falls to be exclusively used for funeral services. And then in 1967, they merged with another funeral home, which when they acquired the second home, which is in Sanborn. And then in 1990, they built the Lewiston location. And in 2011, the Niagara location was actually awarded with Business of the Year. So this is the Sanborn location. So the first question I asked him was, like, why did he choose to become a funeral director? And actually, his dad had started the business, and he had passed away when he was really young, so they had to move into the funeral home. And as he was growing up, he did a lot of work within the funeral home, so he said it kind of was, like, I guess he felt like it was his duty to continue the business. So then I asked him what the tasks were, and he had a lot to say about this, so I'm not going to read it all, but basically he's there to help the family with the death certificate, newspaper articles, organizing with churches and cemeteries, and the visiting hours that usually people have. The third question I asked him was, what's the best and worst part of his job, which I think this kind of hit a little home to him because he had actually lost a child. So he said the worst part was actually dealing with children and the services that they need. But the best part was the thank you in the end from the family for helping them go through this tough time. So then I asked him how many different religions he's worked with since it's a big part of this course. And he's actually dealt with about 13 different religions, most of them in the realm of Christianity, but there was also Lebanese, Greek, Syrian, and Hindu, and even atheist. So I asked him what the most interesting process was, and he actually said that the Greek ritual was the most interesting because one of the 
rituals they performed was that they had the casket opened and they threw cake and poured the drinks onto the body and then buried the body with the food in it. And she had to actually use overtime for the cemetery because they kept dancing and it's like a big party in the end. And then I asked him what were the most common funeral arrangements. And he said that in the last 10 years, the common type of funeral arrangement has changed. <clears throat> Traditionally, you would have the visitation and then the funeral the next day. But more recently, people have been doing a, just a memorial service at a local tavern and then being done with it. But he feels that that's not enough time to actually go through the grieving process. This is the second location, which is in Lewiston. So then I asked him who was the most interesting person he's laid to rest. And it was actually a mafia mobster slash informant. And uh, this person had visited Niagara Falls and had settled down with someone. And he died in a correctional facility. And he was only one of seven people to know about the death. And then he found out that a month later, the media had actually found out this had happened. So there's a lot of hush hush with the whole thing. So that was pretty cool. So then I asked him about the stages of grief and like what ones that he experiences the most. And he said that usually there are five stages, denial, anger, bragging, depression, and acceptance, which is the Cooper Ross. And he said, normally he's dealing with the acceptance stage because it's towards the end, and they're finally laying their loved one to rest. <clears throat> and then I asked him if it's easy to deal with death on a daily basis, and he said after 50 years of doing this, it's become somewhat easier, but he said that the younger deaths have affected him more as he has gotten older, <clears throat> and then he mentions his son who had passed away in the bottom paragraph. Um, I asked him if he felt guilty for working in this situation where it could be as if he's benefiting off the passing. And um, he said that he doesn't see it as benefiting. He says he, he saw it as doing his job, but um, he said he does look good in his suit when this happens because he has a very uh, odd sense of humor, which I guess you kind of have to have a sense of humor when you're dealing with death. Otherwise, it'd get too depressing or something. <clears throat> and then I asked him if he thought this was a difficult job and what are some of the traits that you feel are important for people to have in this field. And he said compassion, understanding, a sense of moral self and communication are all very important. <clears throat> and he said that the best part about this whole career is that knowing that you have helped people in this difficult time make it a little easier as they go through this process. And he said it's extremely rewarding that this is what he does. And then this is the Niagara Falls location. And then that is my, all the information I gathered was from the actual funeral home website. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Allie. And let's turn to uh, Alicia. Are you still presenting? Uh, Alicia, no, I'll take that as a no. And then we'll move to, uh, yeah. wait, Alicia, is that you? No. Okay, Jenna. Jenna, you ready? Yep. Yeah, oh, okay. I'm sharing it right now. Okay. Okay, is my screen up? It is. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Awesome. I would not be technologically advanced for this shit. <laughs> okay. Um, 
So my interview um, was with Dominic Saccaroli. Um, he is a um, the founder of Total Breakthrough Ministries. Um, he spent over 20 years um, working as a Christian minister and um, throughout Western New York um, and in larger events throughout um, throughout the country um, nationally with um, ACN, which is the Amazing Christian Network. Um, so while working as a minister, um, and he's been a great man of faith um, for many years, like I said, um, he hadn't really found his true deep um, understanding and his purpose in life, he felt. Um, up until recently, um, a few years ago, uh, Dominic became an NDE survivor um, when he survived a massive heart attack. Um, so he now has a very interesting perspective on his event, um, as well as how it's affected his life and the life of those around him. Um, and for clarification, he is my uncle, um, but we have never really talked about um, what had happened to him. And I knew that, you know, he had this ministry, but I wasn't really sure what it was. So it was really interesting to really get his perspective on it. Um, so my thesis, um, kind of after I had um, researched, you know, I went on his, his uh, website for um, his ministry and kind of looked into it and uh, came up with a couple of things that I felt would relate to this course. Um, so the power of prayer is something that he really talks about a lot um, and surrounding yourself with people of similar beliefs to yours can help um, in times of suffering. We can't really explain why bad things happen to good people, um, which was actually ironic how that happened to be our forum post the other night. Um, but um, how we choose to react to those instances shows our true strength, true, true strength of our faith. Um, and God has a greater plan for us um, than any of us can ever imagine was kind of like what he um, had talked about. So. The first thing I asked him was um, if he could tell me about his, oops, know what happened here. Sorry, guys. There we go. Um, if he could tell me about his heart attack and his NDE experience. So he was at a funeral in the morning for a cousin. He was high stress but felt fine otherwise. So it was a stressful day all in all, but um, nothing out of the ordinary other than that. Um, he had then later in the evening attended a cousin's wedding um, where he was picked up by his uh, brother and sister-in-law, they drove him and his wife to the wedding, um, who happens to be my father and my mother. Um, on the way home from the wedding, they were fine the whole time there. He felt short of breath, chest pain. He felt clammy. Um, and he feels that the first intervention um, from God was here, where um, my father had taken a wrong turn, gotten off the wrong exit of the throughway and happened to be headed towards the hospital, which is the complete opposite direction from their home. Um, so he felt that, you know, had that not happened, he wouldn't have made it to the hospital on time. Um, he doesn't remember what had happened from that point on, but only what his doctors and what um, the other family members who were with him told him. Um, but he did have, they were brought him back um, into the ER. Um, he had a normal EKG, so they sent him back out in the waiting room. And a few minutes later, he had a massive heart attack in the waiting room, smashed his head on the floor, um, was completely unconscious. Uh, finally, one of the doctors came out, and they rushed him back. Um, and uh, the doctor was Dr. Morris over at Buffalo General. Um, he attempted resuscitation for 23 minutes um, with no luck. Um, finally, 23 minutes later, they were able to get a pulse. Um, but the doctor came out and told the family um, that there was slim to no chance that he would wake up, and if he did, um, they really didn't feel that there would be any brain activity. Um, so his wife, instead of breaking down, knowing that Dominic was such a man of faith, um, she immediately took out her phone and started texting and started a massive prayer chain um, that she knew that he was a part of. And this prayer chain went all over um, not only the country, all over the world. I mean, he had people um, all across you know, all different countries praying for him. Um, and about an hour later, the doctor came out and had come up with this idea to use an ECMO machine, which is a complete heart and lung bypass. Um, the other problem was that he had aspirated all of his stomach contents into his lungs. So he um, needed this full bypass. And the doctor now, you know, looking back and talking to Dominic, you know, because he sees him regularly and whatnot, 
has said multiple times that the doctor himself, Dr. Morris, feels that there was a divine intervention, and he said he's not a man of God, and he doesn't typically, you know, believe in um, those types of things, but he, ever since what happened in this whole situation, he does because um, he doesn't know where he came up with this, this thought, this concept, this ECMO machine, because it's nothing he's ever used, and, um, nothing that he was really even very familiar with. Um, but it did work. Um, after being on total life support and in a coma for about two weeks, he woke up, um, but he did find out that he had lost his sight. Um, so I kind of stopped him at that point and asked him if he remembered anything during his, um, during his heart attack, during his near-death experience. Um, and he said that he did. There was um, a weird feeling like he felt like he was dreaming in white. Um, he felt there were chaotic movements, like he was being rushed around, being pulled back and forth. Um, looking back, he believes that what he was feeling was actually a battle for his life between um, God and the devil. Um, and that not only, not ultimately, you know, did God only forgive him, but decided that he had a larger purpose and wanted to heal him and bring him back. Um, so after he woke up and he realized he had lost his sight, obviously he was very scared, um, constantly praying for guidance, didn't know how he would move on with his life. Um, and his other brother, not my father, um, we have a large family, <laughs> um, came in and told him that he had set up for him to speak at a huge um, ACN Christian event in eight weeks from then in front of 20,000 people um, to share his story. and. He then turned his fear into purpose, and he, you know, then in, sat in his hospital bed trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to share my story? What am I going to say? What am I going to, you know, how can I turn this into a positive? And um, unfortunately, what he didn't realize, you know, being in the hospital bed was that he was a respirator um, and had a trach and was told that he would be there for at least two more months um, because of the damage to his lungs. Um, and a few days later was the third intervention um, in which he believes um, suddenly, you know, he had a, a bleed in his trach. They had to replace it. In an attempt to replace it, um, the nurse actually grabbed the wrong size. Um, and in that time frame, um, basically, he, they realized that he was breathing on his own and he didn't need it and he was discharged shortly after. Um, so a lot of things had to fall into place in order to get him to that event in Charlotte um, eight weeks after. Um, and he did get there and he was able to share his story um, and inspire quite a few people. Um, so he does believe that what happened to him is a divine miracle. Um, so I asked him, I said, you believe that this is a miracle? Did you believe in miracles before? Um, and he said it was really easy for him to accept that this was a miracle because every doctor, first off, was shocked to find out that he was alive when they would look at his charts um, and, you know, look at the condition he was in. It never made any sense to them. Um, the network that he had been a minister in prior to that had um, allowed him, it allowed him to hear many stories throughout the years um, and be a part of prayer networks for miracles for many other people many times before. Um, he does have a lot of testimonies um, to these on his website currently. Um, and he said that he really felt that it's about who you spend your time around. And this I found really interesting. You know, he said, if, he specifically said, if you, you know, spend your time around Democrats, you're going to talk like a Democrat. If you spend your time around Catholics, you'll talk like a Catholic. If you spend your time around Jews, you'll talk like a Jew. So he... Um, he said because he surrounds himself with people of similar faith and people who devote their lives to God um, and, you know, who devote their lives to sharing that with people, um, he thinks that's why he and those around him have been given these opportunities to see these miracles, um, and he feels that God wouldn't show these things to people who don't believe. Um, so then I asked him what Total Breakthrough is. Um, Total Breakthrough was formerly Friends of Dominic Ministries, um, so that is the ministry that he started himself um, shortly after being released from the hospital. Um, it is his local ministry service in Western New York, and it is par partnered with ACN and um, some of the local churches, so he does work with the um, national network as well, as well as a bunch of churches in the local area. Um, they take prayer requests for any and all things. Um, host events, 
um, do outreach, outreach to um, people and try to share the gospel with them. Um, and he's currently developing a discipleship program for people who have recently given their lives to Jesus who want to, um, you know, follow with him. Um, so there's the link to his website there if any of you are interested in checking it out. Um, he's got some really amazing stories of testimonies of people on there, um, as well as some of their upcoming events. Um, so I asked if anyone had ever come to him seeking help or guidance after the loss of a loved one. Um, and he said, yeah, of course, many times he's always had a similar response to them. Um, remember that there's an eternal life after this one, and it's a better life than what we could imagine. Um, he said that we're promised a place in heaven if we give our lives to the Lord and ask for his, their, ask for his forgiveness. Um, remind them that, that, you know, remind the families their loved one is no longer in pain. Um, and not in fear, but feeling a great love and peace that's more than what we could ever feel um, on earth. Um, he has been asked, um, you know, many times and gone and prayed by the bedside of terminally ill patients, hospice patients. Um, and he said that he pretty much always tells them the same thing. Um, he tells them that if they accept that they are sinners and ask for the Lord's forgiveness, no matter what they've done, and um, if they truly do mean that and they truly do want that, um, then they will be given eternal peace and that the Lord would bring them home. Um, he said that the one thing that he did note too was that typically he felt that it was always the family that needed more blessing and needed more guidance and comfort um, than the person dying themselves. Um, typically the family was in more distress. Um, so then I asked him if his thoughts on death had changed since his experience. Um, he said that it definitely absolutely has. Uh, he no longer has a fear of death. Um, his relationship with God has multiplied significantly, and he knows that when it's his time to go, um, you know, that he will go to God's kingdom. Um, he finds that, you know, his situation, his story is a true testimony to the power of prayer, and he feels that he would not be here today um, if it weren't for that prayer chain and all of those people who were praying for him um, and fighting for him um, and for his life. He shares with others who are afraid of death that um, with Jesus, that death is not a scary thing. Um, you know, as long as you have faith, it is something that will um, be okay. And he believes that if everyone really knew and understood um, deeply what was awaiting us the way he feels he now does, that we probably wouldn't fear death. Um, but unfortunately, we're human and we, we fear the unknown and that's okay. That's how we're meant to be. Um, so the last question I had for him, because he kept talking a lot about heaven, was I said, you know, as a Christian, you believe in heaven, so what does that mean to you? And I, these were his words exactly, um, that I put on this slide here, and I thought it was just a really beautiful, um, thing, and it was really kind of shocking to hear come out of his mouth, but he said it's a, he feels it's a place without pain or suffering, an eternal feeling of peace and joy, a place of paradise and abundance, and a utopia of silver and gold the deep understanding beyond what any of us are capable of in our human form, and it is always praising and loving God and feeling his constant love. So in conclusion, um, I just kind of said that in times of pain and suffering, we should always turn to our faith community. Um, that's, you know, a great way to get support and to um, help through and understand, you know, what is happening and um, the power of prayer is as strong as you believe it is. He truly believes in um, in prayer, and so do the people around him. And, um, you know, these prayer chains have worked for them, and they have, you know, saved lives. And, um, and human suffering, um, it can be something that's very difficult to explain, and that's across all religions as we've seen. Um, but as long as we have um, a belief in, you know, something after this life and and faith in that, um, then death is something that we don't need to fear. So that's it. Very good. Great job. Um, so, Victoria, are you presenting today or tomorrow? I'm supposed to be presenting tomorrow. Okay, good. Is anyone else presenting today? <laughs> Going once, going twice. I think we're good. Okay. I, I'm sorry to keep you guys so late, but, but these presents were great, so great job.
uh, everyone. Um, and have a good night. And then I, I guess I'll see uh, Victoria tomorrow and Sarah, right? I'll say yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a great night. Thanks. Thank you. We're working on posting this. Bye.